Hello. Today is January 28, 2010. We're meeting today with Mr. Gene Thompson at his home in Fort Collins, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Gene, and thanks for sitting down to tell your story today. Let, let's start out, if we could. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Okay, well, <clears throat> I was uh, born in uh, Sand Hills, Nebraska, just about in the center of Nebraska, what they called Martha, Nebraska. However, there's no uh, town or anything there anymore. But um, then when I was four years old, we moved to Shadron, Nebraska, and actually that's where I grew up. That's in the northwest corner of Nebraska. <clears throat> I was born uh, 7 11 24. And uh, <clears throat> so then I went to school there at uh, Shadron, clear through the 12th grade. And uh, about that time was when the war started and had to go go to the war. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's back up. Let me ask you a quick question about a couple of other major events uh, around that time in your life. Do you have many memories of the Great Depression and how about the, the Dust Bowl? Yes, I, uh, I have many, many memories of uh, the Great Depression. And uh, so, like in uh, 1933, I remember my father closing the books he he'd had some college, and uh, so he kept books on everything, and he said, Wow, we did pretty well this year. We made $24.50. That was for four of us to live on. And I said, Yeah, Pa, that's pretty good. We done pretty well. Said, His only problem is that you took 25 cents every single Sunday into the preacher and ended up between driving in there and back out, which was 12 miles, nearly all of our income went to the preacher. <laughs> so we didn't have anything left to live on. <laughs> now, what did your father do uh, for a profession? Uh, he was a farmer. Oh, okay. <clears throat> a dry land farmer. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> But I remember before that when when the uh, dust bowl come in there, and uh, every single night, why, you could see that dust uh, building up on the buildings and on the fences, and wasn't very long before you couldn't see the fences at all, and only ha like half of the building. Oh, jeez. And uh, every single morning, well, I and my brothers had three brothers, and and we'd take brooms and scoop shovels and scoop the dust back out the door. It, it'd come like around the door and under the door and build up on the inside so you'd have a drift of dust on the inside the door. Of course back then we all slept on the floor. So we was breathing that dust all the time. Oh boy. But uh, anyway we'd we'd brush off the window sills and fill clear up with dust and then it'd, it'd fall off onto the floor and make a pile down there. We'd have to scrape the window sills and, and scoop all that dust up and throw it back out the door. Next morning, same thing again. And uh, finally, everything just got covered up. Where where we was there, uh, west of Shadron, about 20 miles, uh, we figured that uh, we got around four foot of dust in there, and uh, it covered all of the farm machinery out that we had, harrows and discs and that sort of thing. And, and we had to keep throwing it out back out of the horse barn so the horses wouldn't bang their heads on the, on the rafters. And uh, just fight it every day, all day long. Oh boy. But uh, the strange, very strange thing to me was that uh, when I moved to Fort Collins <coughs> and I started a shooting preserve north of Wellington. And I went out there on that beautiful, pristine buffalo grass and started digging for a basement for the house for the caretaker of the shooting preserve. And uh, 
we dug down about three and a half to four foot and found all of this uh, farm machinery or uh, yeah horse-drawn farm machinery and and stuff that people used back then so right here just north of Fort Collins there was about three and a half to four foot of dust wow. that covered everything and through the years why it turned back into that beautiful pristine buffalo grass it looks like it's been there for centuries I'll be done so I went down to Douglas Lake to start start to build a house there <clears throat> it didn't have any basement in it it was just a crawl space so I got down about two and a half foot for the footings and uh, throwed out a 12 pound brass cannonball huh. and then some more cavalry stuff that uh, was buried there so there, right against the foothills practically was two and a half foot of, of dust Wow! and yeah. people don't realize that that right here at Fort Collins right, they right. had a big dust bowl and uh, out in the library I have a paper that <clears throat> headlines 200,000 Colorado and starving from dust and uh, anyway that that uh, sure made a lot of changes in your life when uh, that dust come in covered started covering up everything and you you keep fighting every day to try to keep your stuff above the dust so it don't get completely lost Wow and, wow and then you have to start building fence on top of the old fence and it's just a a daily fight. I'll be darned. Wow. Well, let's get back here to uh, to your story. So you said okay. uh, uh, after the 12th grade you, you graduated from high school and, and then yes. went into the service? Uh, shortly after that, yes. I When I <clears throat> when I moved to Shadron, was, uh, I was in the fourth grade when we moved. Uh -huh. and, uh, <clears throat> and that was where the dust, where it was all right in the middle of the dust bowl I guess it yeah. but anyway uh, then when when I turned five well, I started first grade in the country school and and uh, then we moved to well we moved literally every year to another place and we moved out on the Bordeaux River when uh, I was in fifth grade and uh, stayed there three years but uh, <clears throat> during that time, things was so bad that uh, I was working uh, first for 10 cents a week and uh, one, one noon meal and had to sleep on the hay in the barn, of course. But uh, then before I got through there working for that fella, well, he was giving me 10 cents a day. And uh, so then I, when I was 12 years old, I left, well, I left uh, home when I was 11. My pa loaned me a hay rack and a team of horses because you could get uh, as much as a dollar a day for a team of horses in a rack. And uh, so I took them and made living with them and made <laughs> living for the family. Wow. Then when I was 12, I... I made up a contract with the United States Cavalry to uh, shoe and break all the horses at uh, Fort Robinson. And, uh, and then we'd send out those, those broke, broke horses and mules. We'd send them out to the other remount stations in the United States. At that time, there was still 12 cavalry stations in the United States. And... Uh, so I got uh, 25 cents for every horse or mule that I could shoe, and then when it come to the breaking the horses, at first I got two dollars for breaking a horse, and then finally got clear up to five dollars for breaking a horse. Oh, wow. Sometimes, of course, it'd take like two months to get a horse broke properly to do what you had to do. So then that finally played out. We got enough horses and mules and, and uh, I had to take some of them down to Fort Riley, Kansas, uh, a train load of mules. Fort Riley, Kansas was a remount station. And uh, <clears throat> so then after that, well, we after we got enough 
to supply all the cavalry in the United States. So I, then I had to go f try to find another job. So the, I went up to see old Guts and Borgum, the Black Hills. And uh, he's just getting underway uh, with uh, Mount Rushmore. And uh, he asked me how old I was, and I told him I was 13. And he says, you come back when you're 14, <laughs> and you can go to work. And so I run. I, the day I turned 14, I was standing there at 6 o'clock, ready to go to work. And, and he said, OK, you run the blacksmith shop. So that's what I did. I've been used to using the forge every day there at Fort Robinson, you know, shoeing horses and mules. And, and so I run the blacksmith shop there at Mount Rushmore <coughs> until uh, I did that the first week. And then uh, after that, uh, on that weekend, why five of the drillers quit and went over to Homestead Gold Mine, which is only 12 miles away from Mount Rushmore. And uh, they could work underground there, work year-round, where it was nice and warm. And actually, the temperature was uh, steady all, all year round. They worked under the, exactly the same temperature. And they had uh, invented a uh, drill stand, so you didn't have to drill against your body like you did over at Mount Rushmore. <clears throat> so the drillers all quit and went over there, so Guts, Guts and Borglum, we just called him Guts all the time, he said, well, you'll have to start uh, drilling for me. And uh, so I, when you drill, why then, uh, when you get up the holes drilled, why you poke this explosive ammonium nitrate into uh, the holes and uh, and put a wire up, put a cap on it and put a wire up and then attach all the wires to one wire and, and go up with it at night to blow the rock out and uh, we'd blow every night at six o'clock. So anyway, I, I did that for quite a while and then I told him that he was wasting money, and all the money that we was using was donated. There wasn't any federal money in it, and uh, told him he was wasting money of feeding those workers out of the store, the butcher shop and the bakery shop and so forth. Back then there wasn't any supermarkets, 37, 38. So <clears throat> I built a little pen there. And and went and got some hogs, and I told him I'd butcher a hog every week and and bake. Uh, he had a great big range there, great big uh, stove, wood stove that had two ovens in it, and I could bake 20 loaves of bread at a time. So I'd I'd bake uh, 20 loaves of bread and, and make that fat back gravy and uh, slice off some of that pork though. And those workers come to life then. They thought that was <laughs> the greatest eating they ever got into. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, we then I, I worked off and on for Guts on the weekends Why he'd call up down to Shadron where I was. He'd call, Gene, can you come up and butcher hog and bake some bread for us? And so I'd go up almost every weekend for a couple of years there after I worked there. And uh, in any spare time I had, why he wanted me to come up and help. And so that was a good job. Uh -huh. and, I, and I worked there at Shadron. I worked for the railroad uh, unloading all of the cattle and horses and sheep that come down from Wyoming, from mostly from Casper. <coughs> and uh, they'd come down there on the Chicago Northwestern and I had to count them out of the car and and pull out anything that had got piled up and, and got tramped that was dead. Pull them out of the cars and and uh, feed and water them and then give them uh, usually two hours and then load them back up in exactly the same car that they was. And I did that in my spare time 
all the time I was in high school. <laughs> <coughs> so I had a whole lot of jobs. That I worked at the freight depot all the time I was in high school. And whenever I, whenever a train come in with freight to distribute to the stores and so forth around the area and the mail, why well, I'd take care of that. And, Boy, it sounds like if you weren't in school, you were working. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, there was, back then there was no such word as play. They, no play. There wasn't, they hadn't invented that word yet. <laughs> yeah. Anytime you wasn't, uh, you wasn't working, you was either sitting up and sleeping, or sitting up eating or sleeping. And uh, otherwise it was work. Oh, for boy. 20 hours every day. <clears throat> No, anyway, we we had a hard time of it, but we always enjoyed it. Yeah, had a good time. Now, do you remember where you were and what you were thinking when you heard uh, Pearl Harbor had been bombed? Yes, exactly. Yes, that was uh, on December seventh <coughs> in nineteen forty one, and and um, I had uh, been to church that morning, and uh, that was on a Sunday, and. Uh, so I went back to the church for a little uh, fellowship with uh, some of the young people. And uh, all at once one of them come running over and said that the ships, our Pacific fleet, had all been destroyed at Pearl Harbor by the Japanese. And I was just dumbfounded. Wow. And, uh, of course, I was getting pretty close to being old enough to go then. Right, yeah. So it wasn't long after that before I got to go. But uh, yes, I remember that very well, and uh, I, just so distinctly. But uh, then I I wasn't old enough quite to go in yet, so the first thing I did was, uh, wh when you were 17, you could uh, go take uh, a, a exam, three and a half day exam, for to go into the Air Corps cadets, and uh, so that's what I did. I went into Omaha. That was a big, big operation. Of course, I went on a freight train, <laughs> bumped my way down to Omaha, and, <coughs> and uh, took that three and a half day test. There was 146 of us that started that that test, and there was only two of us got that passed the whole thing. Wow. That was in the 7th Service Command. So then uh, when when I was in uh, casual camp right after that, uh, waiting for a new class to start, I and the fe other fellow that got through the exam, why well, he developed a heart murmur. So end up I was the only one out of 146. Oh, that, be darn that uh, got to go to the Air Corps cadet system and learn to fly planes. Now, prior to that, had you ever been up in an airplane before? I'd never been up. <laughs> wow. No, I, I didn't know anything about it. And uh, I remember the first first time I went up in one of those little Piper Cubs. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Boy, I seen that ground going away from me. I didn't know whether I was going to like that or not. And, <laughs> And, uh, in fact, I really believe that I never got real comfortable up in uh, airplanes. Is that right? A lot of people just love to sail around up there, but I was always kind of looking where, the, where I'd land if I climbed out. <laughs> so so uh, after, after that exam, did you go into, into the cadet training school yes, right away? Or? No. No, I was only 17 then. <clears throat> so... I couldn't go into anything until I was 18, so I worked uh, construction jobs. I worked at the Alliance Air Base. They're uh, fairly close to Shadron, and at that time, uh, they was uh, going to bring in a lot of paratroopers and give them parachute training up there. They finally found out that it was really too high and too windy, that every jump, why they they just lose a lot of paratroopers because of the the wind and the uh, elevation of it. And uh, so they finally abandoned that operation. However, we did build a, a 
long, well, at the time that we built it, they said that that was the longest runways anywhere in the world. And uh, and I finally ended up as superintendent of that whole thing. I had over 4,000 men working for me. And, at 17? And I was only 17 <laughs> years old. I told them, no, no, don't leave me. Don't leave me here. I don't know nothing. They said, no, neither does anyone else, but they all know what they're supposed to do, so you take it. <laughs> and, <laughs> That was quite a fun time. Anyway, I worked around different construction jobs, and and by that time I was uh, superintendent on several of them, and uh, and then all at once uh, in June, my my birthday wasn't until July, but in June I got a Manila envelope from I guess it was War Department. Anyway, they said you report so-and-so, you're going to be drafted. And I said, wait just a minute. I I took the uh, exam for cadets. They said, well, that don't make any difference. Uh, when when the class opens or whatever, why, well, you can go to that. But in the meantime, you got to go in the service. So as soon as I was 18, why, well, I was on the way. And uh, so... I was drafted, and and uh, they sent me down to uh, uh, St. Louis, Jefferson Barracks, Jefferson Barracks at St. Louis, and uh, and right after I got there, why well, I I said, oh my, I says, you instructors don't know what to do. I says, you're not training these poor little kids. I says, this is terrible, bad. And I says, uh, you got to make a lot more training and, and do something with them. I says, they're just cannon fodder. They're no good the way they are and they don't know nothing. And so they wanted me to show what, what I knew and so I showed them how to, to shoot a rifle with one hand while I was running. Then uh, so you were teaching them to shoot with one hand? Yeah, and... I, was, I was told. I said, "Clear those guys away." F it was on a on a range there at Jefferson, close to Jefferson Barracks, and uh, and it was a build-up range. And I told them, "Clear off those guys that are getting down on the prone there to shoot, and I'll show you how to shoot them targets right along, and I'll I'll hit every one as I run." And uh, so I showed them how to do that, and they said, oh, yeah, that's impressive. Uh, what else can you do? So then I showed them how to throw a bayonet, and uh, I, at that time I could take a, a bayonet and uh, put it within about a, the, si the space of a silver dollar oh, wow. at about 20 foot. <laughs> no, big, no big thing, but uh, uh, when I... When I was real, real young, why I went to a carnival and and this guy had a woman backed up to a wooden wheel there, and he put uh, hand or wrist holds on her and and uh, holds uh, around her her ankles and around her waist, and, and then he he wheeled out a little table there that had throwing knives on it, and and he started that thing spinning. And he outlined her body with those knives uh, throwing them. And I thought, oh my gosh, uh, you could do that? You could whip the world. <laughs> and so I spent all the spare time I had when I was real young uh, learning how to throw knives and axes and bayonets <laughs> and stuff. And I could take an axe and at about 25 foot or so, 30 foot wide, I could cut off an inch of a rope. Every time I throwed it, <coughs> wow. with an axe, with a hatchet or an axe. <coughs> so anyway, I I showed him how to do that and, and uh, several other things, uh, how to break a guy's neck. No matter how small you are, you can always break a guy's neck. It's so simple. If you pull up on one side of the, if you reach over his head and get him by the jawbone. And pull on his head just a little, and then take your other hand, give it a quick twist. While your head instantly comes off from the backbone, 
and anybody can do it. It, it, it actually don't take you can almost do it on the run, and it don't take hardly any pressure to separate the head from the backbone if you just get it tipped a little. That's, uh -huh. that's the theory they use when they put a hangman's knot on one side of a guy's head. Oh, okay. Why it tips his head over. And then, as soon as he hits the end of the rope, why it separates the head from the backbone. It's the same theory. <clears throat> so, anyway, I showed him how to do that and how to break a, a guy's back by uh, twisting. If you, if you get on his back and lean back, why he automatically tries to throw a scissor on you, and as soon as he does, you reach up and get his left arm and pull it over and, and raise up and breaks his back and any small person can do that to uh, almost any big person and uh, quite a few other things I showed him what to do and so the captain there was very really highly impressed and, <laughs> and so I told him I says what we need to do is is not try to train all of them specially, but a few of them, and give them very special training so they can lead the others and maybe train them in their spare time or something and get the thing to go. And, and so that was when we started the Rangers, and uh, we gave uh, all I did was tra uh, train the the non-coms and and the uh, commissioned officers to uh, give them ranger training and showed him how to do quite a lot of different things and get him good physical shape and so forth. So then that summer that I was at Jefferson Barracks, we started what we called the Ranger Organization. Wow. And uh, so then it developed after that, uh, after I was in uh, pilot school and everything, why well, they went ahead with it and, and started the ranger organization. Oh, be nice. So you're one of the founding members of the rangers. Huh? Yeah, I started the whole thing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Down there. And uh, I trained uh, the captain especially, was highly interested in all of those things. And, and so uh, I was training him in off hours and everything else. <laughs> well, he, <laughs> he wanted to work all the time on it one way or another. And, and of course, he was the driving force for, for the whole thing. Uh, when when I was first in basic training and everything, why he was head of it all. Huh. So anyway then as soon as I got just about through basic why my class started and I had to go into cadets and start cadet training. And uh, first I went to uh, Danville, Kentucky to go to college. You took ten months of of college there, concentrated college, and uh, it was uh, um, comparable to two years of going to a university or college. Oh wow! Okay. And uh, and I kind I often kind of wondered about the credits that they gave me, but when I checked in at the University of Nebraska after the war, well, I got every one of those full credits for two years of huh. uh, of college, so I was really glad about that. <laughs> but anyway, then I went through uh, pilot school there at uh, Danville through the college part of it, and then they shipped me to, to San Antonio, Texas. And we, first we went to SAC, what they called SAC was uh, San Antonio Air Cadet Center. and. Uh, and then we went over to uh, Randolph Field and, and Kelly Field. Kelly Field was where we took the final training for pilots. And uh, so I was at Kelly and I uh, was, well, I'd finished up actually my training, my ordinary training, but uh, I wanted to take transitional so I could fly multi-engine planes. And uh, so they started me in on, on that program, which took a couple months longer after you uh, finish uh, plane pilot school. And I, I actually had graduated, but I wanted to take that. And so 
Then in uh, spare time, while I was flying P-51s, and they made me wing commander. And uh, so then they was uh, increasing my grade so that when I left there, I was a captain. But uh, anyway, then when I was about to finish up with it, all of it, why the OSS came in there, Office of Strategic Services, which was the forerunner to the CIA. Yes. Okay. Uh, and they came in and told me that they was taking over my training and that I'd have to go through jump school. Huh. And uh, why do you think it was because of your uh, experience at Jefferson? Do you think uh, that caught well, up to you, or what? How did they come to choose you? Do you think? See, that is the whole thing. It's part of because I started the Ranger organization, uh -huh. but the big thing was because I did all the explosives up at Mount Rushmore. Oh, wow. After I started doing all the explosives up there, and incidentally, uh, we, we, we uh, didn't have a lot of money there, uh, just uh, what the people around Rapid City mostly was donating, the banks and some of the commercial uh, outings there was giving us uh, money to work on and so we didn't have hardly any money so we had to find the most reasonable explosives we could use and that's when we started using uh, ammonium nitrate and uh, and diesel fuel and in order to get this ammonium nitrate we converted a little old Model T into a little pickup and two guys would go around to all the chicken houses and they'd lift up the roost and, and hook it and, and scrape off the top of the manure and, and then load that fresh chicken manure onto that little pickup and bring it back. About everybody had chickens back then and, and they all wanted to get their chicken house cleaned. <laughs> <laughs> so they'd bring that back up there and we mixed it one to three with uh, diesel fuel and then we'd we had wooden tubs and we had big wooden paddles and we'd we'd uh, mix that for oh sometimes hours depending on the temperature more than anything and uh, finally it just all at once it just congealed like butter does in when you when you're churning cream and, and all at once the the butter just instantly makes and you have uh, uh, buttermilk and, uh -huh. and butter, why it'd separate like that. And, and that's the way that stuff would do. All at once it just congeal. And it was like a big tub of plastic then. So we'd we'd reach in there and get some of that and roll it in our hand until we'd get it down so it'd be about three quarters of an inch up to maybe an inch uh, in diameter and uh, and then cut it off in about 12 inch increments and put it in uh, a leather leather bag that we carried on our belt when we was drilling. And uh, then when we'd, and we'd have a, a filler stick or uh, anyway, a stick that was uh, about the size of a small broom handle. And uh, so we'd, we'd put that ammonium nitrate in there and poke it real good with that stick and and then poke a, either a cap or a little bit of powder into the end of it and and, and the end of a electric wire and and uh, bring that wire out the front and we'd do that with every one of those holes that we had drilled and and uh, we'd we'd use different amounts depending on deep how deep we went into the the rock mm -hmm. And uh, we'd get, we'd get uh, if we had to do like only a foot of rock. Why we'd we'd cut them off those increments of twelve inches. We'd cut them off to where they was about seven or eight inches long, and poke that in there, and fill it in, and put that wire in it, and, and then when we'd drill a long ways back in, maybe a couple foot or more, well, we'd fill that clear full till it got about four. Or five inches from the end of the hole, and and then put in our wire and cap. <coughs> anyway, uh, 
would uh, would mix that uh, or put that ammonium nitrate in the, in the holes like that and, and then put the cap or a little bit of powder in there and and this is the most ideal explosive that you can imagine for that sort of work because it goes so slow the gas expands so slow from that that it doesn't actually crack like uh, TNT or uh, mm. nitroglycerin or something like that it, uh, where they go crack you know and, and they just make a crack why it go boo and it just kind of slowly move that rock out uh. <laughs> and uh, not rupture the rock or crack the rock around it you know and so it worked real good that way it was just an ideal explosive for it and uh, and the cheapest thing we could figure out to blow with. Wow. So anyway, then once in a while, just to get rid of a great big chunk of rock or something, why we'd put in a, a half a stick of dynamite or or maybe a whole stick. But not very often use that much, but usually about two or three inches of dynamite and. Uh, so once in a great while, when we just wanted to get rid of large amounts of rock, why well, we'd use a little piece of dynamite. But uh, most of the time, we just used that ammonium nitrate. But anyway, while I was there, why well, I learned all the, I think every explosive that was known to man at that time, <laughs> from old Guts and Borglum, and and how much powder to use and what kinds of powder to use and everything and. So this was uh, one of the most, the strongest factors to the OSS wanting me to uh, take uh, parachute training, and and then uh, <clears throat> what they what they was after was a very small unit that could jump behind the lines, that was versatile enough and knew all of these things that are so important to to uh, people going in behind the lines and uh, that was what they was after to uh, to blow up things and kill all the people and get back to them to the allied lines <coughs> so uh, basically that was what I did all during the war well then when I got over to uh, England and before D-Day and uh, well, I, I guess, let's see, did I take, I guess that was about all the training I took while I was in the service, was just uh, the paratroop training and... Uh, what was that like here, once again, uh, you hadn't been up, uh, you would just gotten used to flying an airplane, now you're jumping out of perfectly <laughs> good airplanes. Yeah, so. and, and you know, that was a lot of fun, <laughs> because uh, like I say, I wasn't too fond of them airplanes and being up off of the ground. <laughs> So when I could get out of them airplanes, and some of them I almost didn't get out of. Wow. Uh, one time the, the plane was hit so bad that it was into a spin and dive when we crawled up and, and went out the back door of it. And, uh, Jeez. I was ready to quit every one of those airplanes. I was ready to get back out and get down on the ground. So I liked the paratrooper part of it. <laughs> <laughs> so you had your uh, a paratrooper training and then and you, at, at what point did you form into your into your special units then? Uh, well, I, I never was in any unit. Oh, was I right? Okay. I, uh, when I first went over, <clears throat> Bill Donovan was head, uh, was the chief head of right. the of the OSS and uh, but he was just head of headquarters and then they had these divisions under under headquarters why you had uh, these uh, different uh, divisions of the OSS and uh, so they told me that I, I'd be uh, heading up combat and demolition of the OSS and I says, well, that, that's good. I know how to do both of them things. <laughs> so uh, that was, and at that time, let's see, they had a call number that, that Eisenhower called uh, GGSF2. Yeah, GGSF2. 
uh, was what he called me on the first time. First time that he called and wanted something done. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> he called GGSF too. And uh, Well, now I noticed you've got a, a, a Supreme Headquarters pin on your hat. Were you attached to Supreme Headquarters? Or? Yes. Okay. Actually, all the the main... Uh, uh, whenever I wore a patch, which wasn't very often, only half a dozen times or less, would I be where I had to wear a patch? Why, I'd wear a chafe patch. Uh, and that's the Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Forces. And, uh, yeah, I, uh, that was actually what I was attached to all the time. Okay. Because, see, after after I went in the OSS and they said, oh, you'll be commander of uh, combat and demolition. And then the first thing I do is get a call from Eisenhower that I got to get some men and get in and and do a job right away and that was on D-Day wow. and uh, and from that time on I never ever knew what the OSS was doing or where they was or anything because every single job that I did well, Eisenhower would call me wow. every well take that back one when I liberated a, a prisoner of war camp there at Sarbrucken why uh, uh, I, I had gone into a Shafe meeting, uh, general staff at Shafe, and uh, and I'd gone into that meeting, breakfast meeting, which I did quite often, and uh, and uh, Eisenhower then he was heading the meeting, of course, and he said. Uh, we've got this problem, he says, uh, that was later in the war, and he says, we've got this problem, he says, we got uh, to start saturation bombing on the Rhine. At that time, we didn't have any smart bombs, we just wiped out everything in sight. Mm -hmm. And he says, we got to start saturation bombing on the Rhine, and he says, there's this prisoner of war camp there at Saarbrücken, which is right on the Rhine, and uh, he says, we got to we got to bomb that area, and and he says uh, if we can't do something about it, why we got to kill the, all of our own prisoners of war there. Mm. And uh, so then he looked over to me and he says, "What can you do about that, Gene?" And I says, uh, "Well, let's see, Sarbrook, and I says that's that's about forty-two miles in. We was at uh, Luxembourg then. Okay. And uh, we had the that big long airstrip." The long and wide airstrip at Luxembourg, which was a miracle thing, and uh, so anyway, it's about 42 miles from there over to Saarbrücken, there on the Rhine, and and so I says, well, Ike, I says, uh, there's no way that I can save them. I says, I can, I can jump in there and turn them loose. But I says, 42 miles behind the lines, there isn't any of them going to get back. I says, they're either going to be taken prisoner again or, or just killed. And he says, well, just turning them loose is something. He says, they, they at least feel like they're on their own, and even if they are 42 miles behind the lines. And about that time, why, a, <coughs> a colonel from general staff, he got up and he says, Wait, he says, I've, I've got another plan. He says, uh, uh, can you fly a, can you fly a German plane? And I says, oh, I'm sure I can. I, I can fly any plane, I guess, if I kind of study it a little bit. And, and uh, he says, well, he says, uh, here's, here's my thought. He says, where this... Uh, this uh, POW camp is, prisoner of war camp, is is kind of on the southwest corner of Sarbrucken, and he says you you might be able to to liberate those prisoners and get them to go on the west side of Sarbrucken, kind of out of the way there, out of the city. He says the camp's already a mile and a half or two miles from uh, the edge of the city, and he says you might be able to take them up the west side there. And he says, you get up on the northwest side, why there's a German air airfield. And he says, they have troop transports there. 
those junker, those big old junker with the motor sideways in it. You got to get out there and, and crank their diesel affairs, you know, and you got to get two men on this big long crank. It's about seven foot long and keep winding that thing till that old Bosch uh, magneto takes hold and, <laughs> and the, the thing finally fires. And uh, so he said there's a uh, Right now, he says, there's uh, several of those troop transports there that are all all ready to go, so they can take men wherever they want. And uh, I said, boy, that, uh, that 42 miles is impossible, you know. And I said, oh, boy, that sounds like an out to me. And he says, if you can find somebody else, well, my buddy that was with me all through the war, uh, he could. He had the same training I did, except for the explosives and stuff and all of that. But uh, anyway, uh, we went in there and and blowed that camp. And uh, I, I'd always take out the perimeter guards myself <laughs> because uh, I was. I I happened to be uh, when I um, went into. Uh, paratrooper training why I was uh, I had enough rank and, and the pull and everything but I was actually too heavy to be a paratrooper huh. yeah I weighed about 235 and uh, I was uh, six foot one and uh, now I've I've lost five and a half inches in height now and about all of everything else <laughs> but anyway then uh, uh, I, I'd take out the perimeter guards, and uh, there's very few of those Germans that was actually as big as I was, but I had big, powerful arms and shoulders. I always wore a 55 coat, and people would say, my gosh, your arms look like the back legs of horses. <laughs> and uh, so I'd, I'd grab them by the nose. I'd, See, they make the same mistake as we do on their buildings over there. Why uh, they they keep the front of the building clear, and that's where the guards have to walk. But where they go and turn at the edge of the building, that's where the bushes and trees are. And so it's just a matter of very silently getting into those bushes and wait until actually when a when a soldier of uh, any nation does an about face and clicks his heels and turns around he's a little bit off off of balance right then and that's the time to grab him and my arms and hands was big enough my hands are still big enough to grab a guy by the nose and, and the chin and run in a double-edged bayonet and uh, if you run it right straight down there you always go clear right through the heart the heart's actually right center there, but when you're using your right hand, you get a little bit to the left, the way the heart beats, and, and uh, so the bayonet would always go right through the heart, and usually you get the carotid artery, and then you rack it a little and get the juggler, and then that gives you a hand hold there. You have that bayonet handle there to, to control him, because you... You can't have him doing any squawking, or or uh, when you do that to a, a man, why he starts his legs jerking, they, all the muscles in his body get a technique condition, and and he starts jerking and and uh, uh, flopping around and everything. You can't have that going on, you know. It's got to be completely quiet and unnoticeable, except for that blood shooting out about twelve foot. <coughs> But anyway, I'd always take them myself and, and do that, and uh, I'd hold on to that bayonet, and I'd usually pull it to, to the side a little so those arteries can shoot out the blood. But it takes about 29 seconds before they completely quit moving. Hmm. When they, they finally quit completely, and you just drop them and go for another one. <coughs> So generally, I'd do that. Well, I did there. Why they had a, they had two guards that 
that uh, would meet and do an about face and go to the edge of the compound there and turn and <coughs> by that time the other when you did one well, by that time the other guard would be about ready to turn to come back and you had to get over there as fast as you could in spite of anyway then then I'd take I had always well I carried actually carried seven of those bayonets most of the time or or bayonets and knives I had those M3 knives which is a double-edged kind of a trench knife but uh, anyway I could by that time I I could take a few quick fast paces and and when the other guard turned around I'd throw a bayonet and, wow. and it runs through his throat but you got to get to him instantly and hold him up so he don't uh, flop all over and, and make noise and Sometimes they'll gurgle and, and you know, and so you got to get your hand on their nose and mouth so they don't squawk. And uh, so that's what I did there anyway. At that. Uh, now on a mission like that, okay. how big of a team would you go in with? Uh, well, it depend on what I had to do. Oh, okay. when, when I went in there at uh, Sarbrook and I took twenty guys with me. Okay. And uh, like when I jumped at uh, Dachau prison camp why well, I, I had uh, well I guess yeah I took 20 but then I had to have a photographer and a, a pencil pusher uh, a colonel that was uh, like headquarters man okay to document uh, uh, yeah and uh, to document it and uh, and uh, Let's see there's... well sorry to interrupt your story there we'll get back to your uh your yeah. liberation well, of that POW camp yeah <laughs> so anyway I, I uh they had a they had a little uh uh like a three foot or, or about 40 inch gate there on the side that they'd go in and out of uh next to the road where the big the big gates were on the road so they could take trucks in supply trucks and whatnot and they had this little gate alongside of that and uh, and of course this is at night and you'd think that they'd have the compound you know lit up but by this time when I did that and we was clear up to uh, Luxembourg why the Germans were scared to death of uh, night bombers and so boy they wouldn't have no light on nothing and, and if they did why well, they'd have a big shade over one bulb you know and have it about half smoked out so that it didn't make hardly any light and that's the way it was thank goodness but anyway we took Bangalore torpedoes in there and they they always mow around those uh, <coughs> camps luckily they hadn't mowed in, uh, the grass was oh maybe seven or eight inches tall in between. And of course they use kind of a bush hog so it uh, don't get down too close to the ground anyway. But anyway we took in those Bangalore torpedoes and, and uh, from our cover because it was where there was quite a lot of woods there and uh, deciduous and, and evergreen both. And uh, uh, you know how the Bangalore torpedo works. You pull the wires through, put them put a tube down the wire and then hook it into the next one and keep shoving it out. And, and so we put one of them under every tower there around the the four towers in the compound there and, and they were blacked out. <coughs> so anyway we we got uh, I got the guards uh, taking care of the perimeter guards and and so we went through that that little gate and uh, I had six guys that was designated just to do nothing but uh, put primer cord around the barracks with uh, D2, D2 explosive, plastic explosive. Take uh, about uh, kind of a half of a, of a handful of it and uh, about every eight foot or so I, you'd, you'd pop that onto the D2 or onto the primer cord. And uh, and so, what we had there was uh, two two barracks of uh, guards and, and uh, utility men that drove the trucks and took care of the grounds and whatnot. And, 
and uh, we had two two barracks of that, and and a headquarters barrack. And uh, headquarters barrack, why well, there was just uh, the officers. It was all they, they always, nearly always. And I never did know what exactly they had there, but uh, I assumed that there was maybe a couple of SS. The SS actually was in charge of the of the concentration camps mm -hmm. and the POW camps. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and then uh, they had other things in uh, the officers' barrack. They had they had a little uh, on the end of it a medical facility where they could take pilgrim in and work on his teeth or whatever he had to be done and, and uh, oh, a couple of doctors and nurses and stuff there and it was all in the headquarters barrack and uh, so anyway we, we wrapped them quickly very quickly just on a dead run and uh, and put D2 on them and uh, and so then we got all all ready, and I had a a big light on a tube, like a flashlight on a tube, and and I turned it on, and and everybody, in the hundredth of a second, that primer card goes thirty five thousand feet per second, you know, and uh, so uh, the whole the whole thing just blew up, and uh, of course then. Uh, Prisoners in there. There was uh, three, actually three barracks of prisoners too. They was parallel with the, with the uh, barracks in back where the guards and everything were. So there was six, six buildings in there, all temporary buildings, you know. And uh, so anyway, uh, the prisoners of war they fell out of their buildings and wonder what the hell's going on after, <laughs> after we blowed that camp. And, and so I got over there and started getting them organized, I and the guys that was with me and and we, they had quite a lot of, a lot of them were uh, like uh, pilots and uh, air, air, air Corps people that had uh, jumped and, and they're actually not given enough proper training to jump back then they weren't and uh, and so a lot of them had broken ankles and sprained ankles and broken feet and, and uh, broke even broken legs and so we had to get all the trucks out of they had machinery shed there on the west side of it they had machinery there in there and there was a half track and and several trucks, four trucks, and uh, and some uh, just uh, like uh, kind of like jeep jeep things, the personnel carriers, and uh, so we we got all of them to go and 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 put all those guys that was hurt bad in them, and and we went that seven miles <laughs> over to this airport there in the northwest corner of Sarbrücken and uh, of course then it wasn't a large airport it was uh, just as kind of a service and supply place and uh, so uh, they didn't have hardly any guards we we took three guards out all that we could find was three guards we got up there uh, oh, it was about 2 30 in the morning I guess it was maybe three o'clock in the morning we got we got there and got fairly close to it and then we went in I and my guys went in to see what we had to do and uh, so we had three guards there that we got rid of and and then we went and I told them first thing you do is find the cranks to three of those uh, junker airplanes and uh, and I says, if we can find the crank, we can get the thing to run. And uh, so we run up there, and it there wasn't any there wasn't anybody about. There wasn't anybody doing anything, and it was all pitch dark and everything. And it was actually the luckiest jump I ever <laughs> ever did. But but anyway, then we 
we got we finally got them planes going. Well, they got to warm up quite a little. So the first thing you do is is get them cranked up and warmed up, and and uh, by that time, why some of the personnel was coming out to see what the hell's going on, you know, and and most of them had uh, burp guns. Ooh. Burp, burp, yeah. burp, you know, and, and uh, the beautiful thing about those burp guns is that they only shoot just a very short distance, you know, and they're they're like our forty five. They're boy, they're sure and sudden death about fifteen or twenty foot from you, but beyond much beyond that they're not much good. And so they was trying to shoot us with them burp guns and they go burp burp in different places around and uh, of course I had my old guys uh uh, given return fire. We had uh, automatic carbines, the uh, folding stock carbines, and uh, <clears throat> so whenever we'd see a flash of a burp gun, well, we'd give them a few rounds. But anyway, we finally got the planes pretty well warmed up and got the guys uh, uh, coming up to, to start loading. And we loaded all of those broken legs first and, and uh, and then run in all the other guys and, and <laughs> finally got took off. We only lost one one guy, one of them. They must have had a 7.9 in there, 7.9 miser. And uh, somebody touched that off and shot through the plane and, and got one of the prisoners of war. Huh. We only lost one. And we're out of there. And then by this time, why it's breaking dawn, and, and uh, by the time we got up into the air, why it was it was uh, fairly light, in fact, and, and we didn't get very far before I seen these 190s, FW 190s, uh, coming in to strafe us, and uh, but I'd called for support before that out of Lux and, and uh, so then our P-51s come in and they come in actually they was below us and then they just come up and went just over us and then they took after them FW-190s and, and uh, we just flew on in and uh, set them down there at Lux. And, oh be darned. How many, how many prisoners did you save that day? 146. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I got 145 of them was still alive when I oh, wow. got back with And you didn't lose any of your men? No. No, we didn't. Uh, you know, like I say, we didn't run into any real fire, but somebody there had to have had a 7.9 to to shoot that far and shoot through the plane. Uh, that that was a regular uh, M1 or uh, Mauser uh, army rifle that the Germans had, that 7.9, you know. And uh, they called eight millimeter, but it was seven point nine. But anyway, uh, yeah, that was a boy. That was a good, a good raid. But we did a lot of just similar. Uh, when I blew up the airport there at Stuttgart, it was about the same kind of deal. Only we had to get, we had to go back forty six miles to to get back to our lines then. Wow. And, uh, so you would normally parachute in for the raid, and then and then just have to, always, by ground have to work your way back forty six. Always months? had to parachute in, yeah. Always, every raid I made behind the lines, why well, I had to parachute in, and, and then we'd get rid of everything that wasn't essential to just uh, sur just uh, survival, and get back, you know. Well, now we had talked and, earlier about patches. You said you'd sell the more patches. Were you and when you would parachute in, were you in civilian clothes, or what were, what uh, were you? Uh, just in fatigues. Fatigues. So if you were yeah. caught, you would still be under the uh, Geneva rules, where you wouldn't be shot as a spy, or how would uh, how would that have worked if you would have been caught? No, but, with spies. Oh. <laughs> yeah. 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 They. That's what I'd tell everybody that went with me. I'd say, I'm sorry, but you got to fight it out to the end because they're going to shoot you for spy anyway. Okay. Wow. And uh, so that. Well, yeah, I'd tell them, I'd tell them, if you ever hesitate, you're dead. As soon as you see somebody that's giving you a glint in his eye, why shoot him and let God divide him up because uh, we can't be a judge and jury here. 
and uh, and I says it don't matter who it is if it's a woman or a child or anything else if they got a glint in her eye I shoot them and uh, and then I'd tell them that there's no such thing as, as they were uh, given up and being a prisoner of war it's impossible because you're behind the lines with the wrong uniform on them. And uh, the only thing we didn't we didn't wear any uh, rank or insignia yeah. or anything like yeah. that. And just plain fatigues all the time. How uh, with with that in mind, knowing that uh, if you're caught, you're dead. I mean, every one of those missions were very dangerous. How would you prepare yourself mentally before a, a, a raid like that? I mean, or, or your men? How would I can't I, I for someone that's never been anywhere near remote to anything like that? I I can't imagine how you prepare yourself for something like that. Yeah, yeah, that. That was the hardest thing uh, for C because uh, I had to check out paratroopers from the airborne divisions. Well, there was just 101st and 82nd over there yeah. then at first, and then the 17th come in, and I, I got guys from the 17th on some of the later raids. But uh, but uh, then in that in those divisions was a type of person that they called the Pathfinder. The Pathfinders were comparable to later on the Green Berets. They were still in the same organization and everything, but but they were the top people there. Yeah. And in every airborne division, like I say, there was only two of them, and the 101st wasn't worth taking in. So it was basically the 82nd that I used all the time. And and uh, I'd, that's all I'd try to work with was the Pathfinders that had that little extra training and knew a little more about what they was doing. And so you had the authority to go into the unit and say, I'm going to take that guy, that guy, and that guy. And yes. And see, that was uh, what, uh, what Eisenhower told me in the beginning. And like I say, when I, the first jump I made there at Cane, France, why well, I was still a captain. And that was fine because uh, there was only four of us went in there to blow up two, two Tiger tanks uh, that was coming down on the 505, and uh, and they had nothing left to do anything to them. They couldn't stop them, and and so the tanks was just coming, you know. Well, they only go four miles an hour is their top speed, and so uh, I said said to Ike when he called, I says uh, the first thing I want to know is how far away they are. He says they're 33 miles. I said, "Oh, I got time," and uh, so uh, uh, the, the uh, what was I going to say the <coughs> the uh, oh yeah the training about the training uh, paratroopers in World War II were not Rangers, and the Rangers were not paratroopers. And I was the guy that had to try to marry him. That's right. why, yeah. why they, the special forces all call me the grandfather of all the <laughs> special forces. And they keep sending me different stuff. <laughs> uh, rifle pens and all kinds of different uh, stuff that special forces use nowadays. And uh, anyway, <clears throat> ordinarily what I do was was uh, if I was, if I knew uh, like a day or two days ahead or something like that, why well, I'd try to get the guys that I needed, and ask them how much experience, what have you done, where you been, and uh, everything, and if you have any qualms, because I says this every one of these is a total suicide mission, oh, and you're not expected to come back, and uh, so uh, I, I'd quick ask them that and then I'd try to give them a little bit of quick training so that they had mostly so that they had confidence because there wasn't any question to me in my mind that uh, that uh, my my job was to get rid of primarily SS troopers all during the war whenever I seen SS I shot them yeah. no matter what and uh, and uh, and I did that with with every, a, a lot of a lot of different outfits. When I blew up that uh, airport at Stuttgart, I uh, <coughs> I went into that building. It's a, 
the the buildings that they have there are, are you familiar with Linderhof Castle? Mm, not no. really. Yeah. Uh, it's a plain little castle that. Uh, Uh, anyway, the Chancellor of Germany built uh, <coughs> Lud, Lud, yeah, Ludwig II built, uh, let's see, he built uh, Linderhof, Neuschwanstein, Hohenschwangau, and, uh, and the Königsschloss, and uh, Hesse, and the one that Lud, Ludwig Schaven, he built uh, five, six. He built six castles. Was he the, the crazy king? Yeah. yeah. Okay. The one they drowned up there yeah. above uh, New Schoenstein. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, uh, the Linderhof Castle there is uh, south of uh, Munich, where you can go on that little ring towards uh, Unterammergau and Oberammergau. And just beyond Oberammergau is a road that goes in. in a little bit on that circle to Linderhof, and it's it's a it's a straight castle, a little bit like uh, some of our public buildings in Washington D.C. with a uh, few columns on the front of it, and and a, a double stairway around the big stairway that goes up, and a double double stairway that goes down, and. Uh, and they uh, was going to have the German officers. A lot of them was going to have a meeting there. Actually, they said there was 62 German officers going to have a meeting there, and, uh, and that was what they was after. Plus, they had a whole lot of aerial photos in a file there that was in the northwest corner of the meeting room, and so we were supposed to jump in there and wipe out the perimeter guards, the outside guards, run up them steps, go down the hall to the end room, and uh, they had two doors there, kind of a center door and an end door that went into this meeting room where these German officers was. On that, that big room was the whole west side of that big building. And uh, they was going to go in there and study these uh, aerial photos that was in this steel cabinet there, a filing cabinet. And uh, so they wanted me to get rid of the aerial photos and kill as many officers as I could get killed. And uh, so that's what we did there. And, and uh, we just died. Uh, there, uh, I only had six guys besides I and my buddy and, and uh, in D2, we had a guy with us all practically all the time that we called D2. He was a uh, he was the man to put the, the explosives <laughs> where we wanted them, and uh, <clears throat> and the three of us did almost all the raids together. But uh, like I could say from the beginning, uh, they called us GGSF2 because there was two of us, I and Kapuff. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, we we jumped in there and, and wiped out the perimeter guards and the guards, all them officers come in, in vehicles and they had vehicle garage there and, and uh, so there was oh, three or four different guys there and uh, we just uh, we just took all of the people that was around there and got rid of them and. And then all the rest was officers up in that room, and uh, so we, I and Kapuf, grabbed all these grenades. We had these, these big pockets. We'll hold eight grenades, or they'll hold about eight pounds of D2. And uh, so you can put those grenades on one ring, <coughs> and all the pins on one ring. Or you can take all, you can take each grenade off and pull it. When you pull it while well, it's live and uh, you got to get rid of it or, you know, as soon as you let the handle go, well, you got to get rid of it. Well, when you, when you pull it off of that, when you pull it off on those rings, why well, the handle's got to come off because that ring goes through the, that little hole in the bottom of the handle. And... Uh, 
So anyway, uh, we had uh, each of us had 16 grenades, and uh, along with our primer cord, we'd wrap that roll of primer cord around us. So and if we got into trouble, we could blow up things behind us or whatever, you know. And so anyway, uh, uh, we run down the hall, and, and he he took the end door, and, and I took the middle one. And we opened them right at exactly the same time, and looked in there and it was clear full of German officers and, and so we slammed the door back closed and we had we had those little stubs, just a wedge, wooden wedge, you know, with a little rubber on the bottom and we kicked that under the door. And, uh, and we also had the, the door holders. All the casing over there is four and a quarter inches wide alongside the door. Instead of two and a quarter like ours is what four and a quarter and so you have these these uh, door holders that you can, you can pull out, and, and they have a sl slot in a piece of leather on the, on a piece of uh, cord stuff, cording, and uh, and you put that over the the doorknob and hook it over that four and a quarter inch, and then they can't open the door in, or if they open out into the hall, you have those stubs, yeah come up to the door and open it and then close it and kick a stab under it. But they all, they all have those, uh, what do you call those, where they have window over the door. And they, transit? Huh? A transit window? Yeah. Uh -huh. some, some other word, but anyway, I get things mixed up with the German words quite a lot, uh -huh. and I forget all of it. But anyway, uh, they have those, and, and sure enough, luckily, we, of course, we could, they was uh, big high ones, and uh, we could uh, just throw the grenades through it, but luckily they was, they was open to about, uh, oh, more than a 45, about a 60 degree, and uh, so I was keeping track of, of Kapuf, and I, I got both rings out of grenades, and and he got them out, and, and then I, I showed him I, was, I got a hold of the rings for all of the handles, and uh, and all at once we just when I pulled, while well, he pulled, and we throwed them through those transit transit windows, yeah, and uh, we throwed them through those transits, so they got 32 grenades all to once, and uh, it just tore up everything in there. We had to go in shoot a few of them, but uh, they're, they're done for anyway, you know, but uh, they put a few of them out of their misery. And uh, and so then uh, the the uh, cabinet that had the uh, aerial photos in, we jerked it out from the, from the wall and we wrapped it around with that primer cord and uh, run, run a length of it on down the hall and you know the second you touch it why it goes and uh, blow that huh. blow those uh, aerial photos up blowed up the whole cabinet and everything killed all the people and then we had had to get back there and it was between 46 47 miles well we had a lot of explosives left so we went around the fence there and went over to the this building faced the airport on the west side and then it faced east. And uh, it's the main airport there in the Stuttgart. And so went over there and we had a lot of explosive left that we didn't want to carry back, you know. And so we went over there and wrapped the tower and blowed it up and, <laughs> and uh, several other installations there and, and some of the transport planes. And, and, uh, blew up about everything we could find to get rid of our explosives and then we had to split. Well then that time we had to cross the Rhine. This was this was the hardest thing to do was to get across the rivers because you can't go across where the bridges are. Yeah. You know, all the bridges have some soldiers there anyway and, and uh, so you gotta you gotta stalk that river, go down and see, find some farmer there or something that that's got a little boat that wants to, that goes back and forth across that river, you know, and 
you've got to confiscate that boat whether he wants you to or not and, and get across that way because you can't take no bridges and uh, see I had a I had a special rifle when I first went to go in when they told me what I had to do and everything I says I can't use that uh, grand rifle I says that's the biggest loss of anything I ever seen and I don't want it and so they made me a big special rifle, a Browning automatic rifle that was a 300 Magnum. Strangely enough, the the straight uh, 300 Magnum is the same length as the tip point. They had kind of a blunt point, but the tip point on a 30 out six is the same length. So they didn't have to alter the chamber any, and uh, the, all they had to do was alter the bolt, bolt a little and, and uh, remount for that uh, 300 Magnum. And uh, and they did that at uh, oh the they call it that that uh, armory armory there in um, in Illinois. Yeah. And uh, they, we asked them if they could get that done before ever I went over, even before I went overseas. And they said, "Oh yeah, that's no problem." They said, "My, we can, we can have that done in about four hours." And uh, how many do you want? And everything, you know. <laughs> and so anyway, I had that special rifle, 300 Magnum, as opposed to their 7.9. Well, you know, if you're back 400 yards and they. This crowd shoot at you with that uh, 7.9. You can literally see the bullet come and catch it. You know, <laughs> at 400 yards. Well, I could kill people at 800 yards with that with that 300 Magnum. And uh, of course, I had to have a. That was the other guy I I had with me about all the time was a guy carrying the big big bullets, <laughs> ammunition <laughs> bearer. <laughs> I'd tell him. I'd say. Stay, stay back and stay down, but don't lose track of me. <laughs> when I want bullets, I want them fast. <laughs> so I had him with me about all the time. Different ones, of course. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, that was what I did, and uh, and we had some real good jumps and really got along fine. And then others, why we had had our own problems and uh, I got along fairly good. <clears throat> I was coming back one time, got almost to to our lines when I run into a reverse machine gun and he ripped my belly open here. Well, oh boy. that usually isn't uh, too bad of a thing uh, if you can get it out and get it cut and tied and uh, that's what, what it did, this buddy of mine. He just opened it up right then and, and tied off the guts and, and uh, so then that that worked until I got up to Liège, Belgium and, and they fixed on it, worked on it. Wow. But, uh, but anyway then when that machine gun got me, three of the bullets went through my guts there and, uh, and so then I was I got up after they got me. Why I crawled real fast, as fast as I could wiggle along the ground. I wasn't actually crawling; I was kind of wiggling along the ground. But I wiggled real fast and and got up within grenade distance. And I pulled a handle on two grenades and <coughs> throwed them in there. <coughs> in this machine gun nest, and they worked perfect. They just went right in and blowed up. Hmm. You know, I thought, well, that's the end of that. And I was getting pretty weak by this time, and and so then I stood up, and I got almost to the machine gun nest, and a big kraut come up out of there with a bayonet on his rifle. Oh, jeez! And boy, he wrecked me. He just wrecked me. He he took from from clear down here, and he raked me all the way up, and, and raked my arm all the way up, and. And uh, I was getting weaker and weaker. I finally, he 
he rammed me in the knee and it, uh, he tried to just kind of flip it sideways and it didn't flip in that hundredth of a second that it took for him to realize that it wasn't going to, that he had to pull it straight back instead of kind of flipping it. And uh, in that, well, I got a hold of his bayonet and then I got out of M3. I had M3 on my belt and, and I got it out and butchered him out. But I couldn't figure out how he got through them grenades. But he, somewhere or another, he did. He had something in there to protect him. But, but by that time, I was done for. And my buddies hauled me into a German barn there. And thank goodness we had some German people that wasn't liking what was going on. And so they kind of took care of me until, like I say, we was, we was right at the lines then mm. when I ran onto that reverse machine gun. And uh, so the next morning, that was kind of late in the afternoon, evening, when, when they got me. The next morning, why the Allies had, had uh, covered that ground. And uh, so I picked up by one of those little stretcher airplanes and took back up to Liege. <laughs> I was in Liege three different times in the hospital there. Wow. <clears throat> How how long were you, how long did it take you to recuperate from that? Uh, uh, that didn't take very long. They <laughs> they uh, <clears throat> already had the hole there and everything, and and because uh, Kapuf did that and tied them off, <clears throat> so all they did was reach in there and, and strip the gut down and uh, clean it up re <coughs> real good. <coughs> but they when they fixed it, why they they kind of pulled one end over the inside, over the other end a little bit, and then they just sewed it around. Hmm. And uh, and so then later on that gave me big trouble. I had to have that all done over. Vanderskow here in Fort Collins was the one that he took literally all my guts out and washed them out and redid them wow. there. They'd they'd fixed uh, several places, and every one of them got kind of a gangrene into them, and peritonitis or whatever. And uh, so he fixed it all. And, uh, wow. Do any of these injuries still give you trouble to this day? Uh, Is there anything? That, uh, no? Well, I yeah, I don't you know I don't eat uh, spicy stuff or raw stuff or anything. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't even drink like orange juice, too, too huh. acidy. And, uh, so how many, altogether, how many missions did you go on at Miami Raids? I, 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 went, I jumped behind the lines 11 times. 11 times, wow. Yeah, there on the Wall River, that was a bad one. When, uh, I don't know whether you remember that, that battle or not. Uh, there at uh, Eindhoven. The 101st was holed up there at Eindhoven, uh, Holland. And uh, see that road from Eindhoven over to uh, Nijmegen, Nijmegen, Holland. And the Wall River goes through Nijmegen there. And uh, and so the, the 82nd was there. That was uh, Montgomery's uh, market basket. Mm -hmm. Market garden. Market garden. Uh, that was his uh, market garden uh, fiasco that about lost the war. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, uh, Eisenhower called and uh, he said that uh, the, the the 504 and the 505 was there, and uh, the 505 was on the southwest side of that bridge there, in the kind of a uh, just back of a little park. Uh, over there, they have they have uh, these uh, kind of ha half moon uh, uh, parks at the end of the bridge 
for bridge maintenance and to put machinery and all kinds of stuff. And they have these little parks on all those major bridges that way. And that's what they are. They use them as parks. And uh, they have tables and trees and all kinds of stuff in those little half moon places. And then they'll have the main road going past the front of it. <coughs> And they're all built that way, and uh, anyway, uh, the 505 was holed up there at uh, Nidge Megan on the southwest corner of that bridge that crosses the Wall River. That was actually supposed to be the most important bridge in, in Europe to get to save or get across or whatever. And, uh, and the Krauts had it all mined with explosives so the whole thing was ready to blow up and, and uh, they was on the other side uh, actually in uh, at the edge that goes to the edge of Nijmegen there from from the main part of the downtown of the city and uh, <clears throat> the 505 was holed up there in the buildings part and there was a bunch of krauts in this park on the west side of the river and they had uh, two TDs tank destroyers and uh, and they had some pretty formidable uh, stuff and, and uh, mach heavy machine guns and that sort of thing you know it it wasn't no phony operation boy they had her pretty well taken care of on the other side of the bridge there at Nijmegen was uh, one, two, three, six, was seven. There was a big pillbox in the middle and three s small pillboxes, those round ones, uh, on either side of that big one. And they, the, the smaller pillboxes was uh, along the road and then the big one was kind of at the corner and then three of them where the, where the road divided and got wider. And, uh, <clears throat> and those were on both sides of that uh, uh, street that went through the bridge there. And uh, so what, what uh, the first thing that uh, the Allies were supposed to do was to some way get those uh, wires cut on that bridge so they didn't go ahead and blow it. And on the other side, they had it, uh, quite a lot of 88s and everything, and they was giving the 505 just a terrible amount of real bad trouble to uh, hold up basically just on the other side of the bridge. And uh, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, the 504 then was downstream, and what they were supposed to do was get across the the Wall River and it's a very fast deep roaring river and quite wide and uh, and they were supposed to get across the 504 that was uh, Major Cook I don't know whether you remember that operation or not but anyway Major Cook had in the 82nd Airborne he had the 504 and uh, and uh, Vaughn Vanderhoof. Vanderhoof had the 505. Major Cook was a major and Vanderhoof was a lieutenant colonel. And uh, so they had both divisions there of the 82nd Airborne. And, uh, and so <coughs> uh, Vandervoort hold up there on the top by the bridge and uh, and he had two tanks, two Shermans and uh, and that TD got one of them right in the middle of the road before they got it blowed up and then they got the other tank destroyer that was in that park. They got it finally silenced. But Cook down there with the 504, he was a whole mile and a half or so below the bridge 
he was supposed to cross on some pontoon boats and his guys were supposed to come up there on the on the German side of the bridge and cut those wires. This is an impossibility. It's an impossibility. And they realized it before, as soon as they found out the armament and uh, that that was all covered with 88s and pillboxes and all kinds of stuff. So I, as soon as they realized that, why well, they knew that it'd be impossible for for uh, Ma Major Cook to get to 504 across there and come all the way up there, almost two miles, and cut those wires before the crowds come to life. Yeah. That's an impossibility. And uh, so Eisenhower, he he was wild by that time, and he. <coughs> In the first place, they couldn't get the they couldn't get the uh, pontoon boats because the English was going to furnish them, and they couldn't get them. They were somewhere else, and and they were supposed to bring them in. Never did, never did, never did. And Eisenhower realized that it was a oh, uh, impossible situation anyway. And of course, Montgomery was the one that was supposed to be running this whole operation, but he. He didn't have no idea at all what he was doing, zero, and he didn't figure on all of the opposition there. And consequently, they just destroyed all those English troops. But anyway, uh, Eisenhower called me and he said, Gene, you got to go into Eindhoven and, uh, and get whatever you need and get in there. He said, uh, it's an expendable operation. He says, I don't expect to ever see you again or anything no, no. else. And uh, he says, I know none of you will ever get through it, but he says, it's got to be done. And I says, no problem. I says, that's what we're here for. And uh, so uh, I went into Eindhoven. I was actually down close to Paris then when he called on the radio. And, and uh, so we just liberated Paris, just liberated it, and uh, so then anyway, I turned and went up to Eindhoven. I and Kapuff had a jeep, and we went up there. Well, D D two was with us too, and uh, so we went out to the hundred and first. And meantime, why Eisenhower sent over four uh, C forty sixes, so we could jump out of them and. <coughs> And I got 200 of uh, 101st Airborne, uh, the Screaming Eagle, mm -hmm. and uh, and I got 200 of them. Most of them never got exposed to combat, and here I'm getting them to do a suicide mission. Wow. But anyway, I told them what had to be done, and I says, we're going to... We're going to go in there and we're going to jump just a little over 300. I says, the chute won't even have time to completely open. And I says, uh, try to try to keep the leeward side of it so that you can slip it where you want it and and, uh, and you're going to hit hard. And I says, you got to come in on the bank of that river right there by the pillboxes, right back of them, because all of the pillboxes had, had those slots towards the road all the way in there and towards the bridge and uh, I says we're going we're gonna to jump back in those pillboxes and uh, so the German army will have access to you and the first thing you got to do is run as hard as and fast as you can to that pillbox and get close to it and get get down behind it and come around the top edge and, and feed in some grenades. And uh, I says, it don't matter if you stand there or not, because uh, those grenades won't blow the pillbox up. It'll just kill the people inside. I says, as soon as you put one grenade in, I wait one or two seconds and put another in, then put another in, and, and keep feeding them in. I says, don't matter if they blow up. Why, it isn't going to hurt you. And, and so I says, you got four seconds from the time you hit. Well, we just got those shoots. That, that you turn the mm -hmm. buckle on and hit and, and all the straps come loose. we just got those, so that was a big bonus. I said, from the time you hit the ground, it takes about four seconds for a kraut to, to determine who you are, get his rifle on you, and pull the trigger. 
And I said, just start counting. One, two, three, four. And if you aren't covered by that time, you're dead. And uh, so that was the way we went in there. I, I had 12 guys. All they had was uh, automatic, the automatic carbines, the folding stock carbines, and, uh, and a few grenades and wire cutters, 12 of them with wire cutters. And uh, so that's the way we jumped in there. They wasn't supposed to fight or anything. They were just supposed to run for the cover of the bridge, get under there and cut every single wire as fast as they could. And uh, so that's what we did. We got those. C forty sixes or forty sevens. It was C forty sevens that we got from uh, England, and we flew in at uh, about three hundred and forty foot. And uh, what we did, I told them to to come in, and if they could, kind of get back those eighty eights, and then cross where the eighty eights was, and dump us out behind the pill boxes. And so that's what they did, but none of them got through it. All four of them went down. Oh, is that right? Yeah, they just shot them up. But uh, anyway, we got out on that deal. They didn't have time to shoot them up before we got out. And so we got out and, and uh, secured those pillboxes. And then I says, as soon as you get the pillbox secured, the very second that you get it secured, why? Go around on the other side, and there's a little trench there and a hole underneath. And I says, uh, get into that pillbox. And uh, I says, then any crouch you see from the German army back of us, why, why keep them neutralized. And, uh, so that was our scheme anyway. And so we went in there, but I lost nearly all of them. I only got back with 38 of them. Out of the 200? Out of 200. Yeah. But anyway, it, uh, it you know the whole thing was a fiasco, and then and then as soon as I got as soon as uh, we got things kind of neutralized, got all the pillboxes manned by the guys that I had taken in. Why well, then I went out on Kapuff. We we never stopped at any pillbox or anything. We just went across the front of them, just throwing in grenades, just fast as we could run. And he took one side and I took the other. And uh, so anyway, we we got our own guys in those pillboxes, and, and then the Krauts begin to have a few problems. Then uh, the, the Americans had pulled up uh, a couple of seventy fives and and was uh, laying them in there around them eighty eights, and and so the Krauts finally decided they was going pull out of there. And so they was getting their stuff together by the time we we got our cells kind of halfway organized and got the wires cut. And uh, and so anyway after that why Eisenhower said, Gene, he says, you can't you can't go on the way you are. He says, that's impossible. He says, you're only a captain and you can't you can't go in and and take that many men and be responsible for them and, and take those planes and tell those pilots, most of them are majors or lieutenant colonels or something, uh -huh. and he says, you can't tell them what to do. And uh, so he says, we got to start giving you some rank here. And so then he raised me up to major and then just a little bit later was lieutenant colonel. Wow. What? But uh, <clears throat> he says, uh, your res the responsibility that you're, you're assuming, why he says, you got to have more grade. Going to be in trouble. And uh, oh, anyway. Wow. But anyway, we got the bridge blowed, and then I went out and waved to Vandervoort, and, and he waved back, and then the eighty-second come over. But there was so many. See those those poor devils in those park in that park at the end. Those crowds. Why, good grief, there must have been 300 of them. They all had to do something. And uh, some of them jumped in the river and tried to swim across, but but most of them tried to do it on the bridge. And Vandervoort was lined up with the bridge, so anybody that get on that bridge, they they's going to stay there for a while. <laughs> and uh, so the whole entire bridge was clear full of bodies. And they had to take about eight or ten guys ahead of the tank. They only had one tank left, uh, Sherman. 
and uh, pull the bodies out so the tank could go across the bridge. And then by that time, why the the Krauts was dragging out of there real fast. And, and they went up over the hill there to uh, the little town there. I can't think of the name of it now. It's A-A-R something. Sar, no, not Sar. Uh, R, oh, I can't think. But anyway, there's a little town there. But uh, British 6th Airborne and part of the Home Guard was up there at that. Here come all these crowds retreating with all them 88s and everything. They they almost obliterated all of those two divisions. Wow. Yeah. There was, uh, what they say, something like 700 left of a full division of uh, their 6th Airborne. Wow. Wow. And, and that there was no use for it. Montgomery just, you know, he just messed up the whole entire thing. And uh, <clears throat> so anyway, then anyway, we secured the bridge, and, and then you know I'm out of it. I go back by six by six, and and uh, the eighty second and hundred first. And uh, the rest of the British Home Guard and a whole lot of troops stayed there at the Eindhoven Bridge, but they they didn't go no no further. That was it. And uh, they stayed there. They actually dug trenches and stuff during World War Two. Huh. Was doing trench warfare there for huh. almost till the end of the war. It was ridiculous. It was the most biggest mistake of the whole World War Two. Wow. Was there any of the, the 11 missions that you went on where, where you were in the thick of it, you thought, you know, this time I'm not going to make it out? I mean, was there oh, yeah. the worst? The second the second time, we, we went back there to uh, uh, Nijmegen, and uh, <clears throat> this was, it was kind of a, actually it was the biggest action of the whole war. There's more troops, more Allied troops than any other battle of the whole war. But we went back there the second time, <coughs> and they had gained a little bit of ground there up uh, east. See, they wanted to, they wanted those bridges and that highway that goes into the industrial part of Germany there. And uh, as soon as they can get rid of the whole entire industrial part of Germany, the war's over, you know, and, uh, and of course that was Montgomery's idea to do that, and uh, uh, didn't work out, and we lost the whole thing, and lost all the people, and everything else, but, uh, but anyway, uh, then, because nothing had been actually accomplished and the 82nd had finally pulled out of there for regulars for infantry outfits uh, uh, part of the third division yeah the third division and part of the fifth was in there and, you know they're regular infantry outfits and they have a certain amount of guns and artillery and tanks and, and the whole bit uh, <clears throat> but anyway uh, uh, I think the, not, some of the 90th might have been there too. But anyway, uh, they said, well, we still got to there. That was about the end of the war, close to the end of the war. Well, it was in March, I guess. Yeah, March. So close, close yeah. To March, see, March, April. Yeah. May. <clears throat> yeah, that's when it was. It was about the 1st of March. And uh, went back in there, and that was the biggest battle of the whole war and all the airborne, the 82nd and uh, 101st and, and the 17th was all in that, all three of our airborne divisions and the, the Canadian 15th that was attached to the British 6th was in there and uh, anyway 
My gosh, there was thousands and thousands of airplanes, and they, all the paratroopers that was available in Europe, and uh, we all went out there across them. Well, they, they're, uh, they're just before you get to. For some reason or another, I can't think of that industrial valley there. Ruhr? Ruhr? The Ruhr Pocket, yeah. The Ruhr Pocket. Uh, <clears throat> before you get to that, about halfway from Nijmegen to the Ruhr Pocket there is a hill, a big valley. It's similar to the one that's, I don't know whether you've ever been to Luxembourg or not, but uh, Romans built a there's a great big valley and hill right in the middle of Luxembourg that the Romans uh, hollowed out that hill and then they made tunnels out to shoot from or to let their legions come out of. And, uh, and anyway, uh, that's what there is there about halfway to the Ruhr Pocket. Why, there's a big long hill there, great long hall. Oh, it, it's uh, probably a mile and a half that you can drive trucks into and and then go out to those uh, places where they had 88s and heavy machine guns and tank destroyers and all kinds of stuff. So Eisenhower called me and he says, well, everybody else is going. He says, uh, and, and we don't have anybody to, to actually get in that hill and, uh, and disrupt the thing here and there. And he says, what I want you to do is jump in there so you're close to the the south end of that hill and uh, get in there and, and just blow up everything that you can find. And, uh, I, okay, so that's, I went to, along with all the other airborne, <laughs> all the airborne in Europe. <clears throat> but just as I hit the, I was jump master, of course, and, and so just as I hit the doorway to jump, well, 88 went out, off right out in front of me, mm. and it uh, cut off all my teeth and cut my tongue almost off, and, and uh, I had shrapnel all over in my throat and neck and all this shoulder and arm, and, and, uh, and I, I just put my, when you jump, and you grab the door and you jerk your head back so it, so when you hit the prop blast it don't jerk your neck and separate your head from your spine you know and so I'd put my head back against my shoulder and, and grab the door and I was ready to jump and that's when that 88 went off right out in front tore up the plane the plane started going down and, but uh, I didn't know it, it was, uh, because I had my head back that way why that hot shrapnel on that shrapnel coming off them 88's is red hot you know and uh, that's one good thing in a way because it it cauterizes uh, mm. uh, as it goes in mm -hmm. but anyway it went all in my mouth and my cheeks and my right side and uh, and three pieces or I don't know how many pieces but anyway it made three holes in my skull <clears throat> they went back in my when I tipped my head back, why they went in there and bounced off the top of my helmet, and so I had three plates. When I went back to Liège, Belgium, that time, why they put three silver plates on the top of my head. But of course, when that went off and and those pieces went through my skull, why you know that I didn't know anything zero from then on. But the plane was already going, starting to go down. And so Kapuf, he was second in line after me, and he grabbed me up and throwed me out because, you know, he, I was in the way anyway. Yeah. And then there's no way that I could live through a plane crash, you know. And so he thought, well, didn't know whether he's dead or not, but throw him, throwed me out. Well, I'm on a static line, of course, so my parachute opened and everything. And, and I went down, and, <clears throat> and I was close to a big shell hole. And uh, I didn't know that until later. I didn't know. I was clear out of it. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything. I was totally paralyzed. I couldn't. I couldn't move my eyes or nothing. But I knew what was going on. 
and uh, and so <clears throat> he had to to take care of some some ground people there, some German infantry or something that was down on the ground, and he went and, and got the guys going and and took care of them. They were kind of at the entrance where you go up into that hill and. Uh, so he got them neutralized, and, and then he come back, and and he pulled me over into the shell hole, and uh, boy, I, you know, I was just completely, totally covered with blood, but, and uh, and he said he tried to listen, but there was so much noise going on from planes and artillery that he couldn't hear much, and so he figured I was dead, so he took my rifle, I carried it in a on my back in a big sheath and uh, <coughs> so <coughs> anyway he 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 took uh, my rifle and and he says well buddy he says I guess you won't need this anymore and he pulled it out and, and I remembered him doing that <laughs> and uh, so anyway uh, they went up and and uh, blowed up a bunch of that hill and, and went in there and clogged up the, the entrance so that nothing could go in or out and and worked some of the some of the tunnels out and blowed them up and and uh, by that time why some I think it was the fifth division the Red Diamond came in and, and took over infantry division came in and took over our job for us and, and so anyway uh, uh, by that time why somebody had found me and and by that time I, I could feel my little finger start, hmm. starting to move and uh, so a guy found me and he hollered medic and, and uh, the Krauts was pulling back then pretty fast and uh, and so they got in a one of those little stretcher planes and took me back up to Liège, Belgium, <laughs> to the hospital there. <clears throat> but anyway, that that yeah, that was the time that I didn't know, wow. you know, whether <laughs> I'd ever see daylight again or not. Wow. I thought, yeah, I'll go meet my maker now. And, and uh, so, well, that's part of it, you know. Back then, why well, a soldier was a soldier, and you figured. Is out there to do the job. It didn't matter what you did, whether you come back or not. Is right? that right? Wow. Yeah, and uh, you you had to you had to do it. You had to do it, no matter what. If you knew absolutely knew without any doubt that you was going to be killed, you had to do it. And uh, because uh, that's that's your job. So anyway, I, well, I was in Liège quite a while that time. Well, that was like I say toward the end of the war, just before we went into the rear pocket there, and uh, <clears throat> so then it took a long time for that to kind of heal, and uh, and uh, they took out a whole lot of that shrapnel, but they left quite a little in too that since just disappeared. I had ch little chunks of it all over in the shoulder. And I had a pretty big piece here in this cheek that they didn't take out and had to have taken out quite a lot later. But uh, anyway, uh, I, I just uh, got to feeling halfway decent in uh, the hospital there in Liège. I'd, I'd been there three weeks then. And so I says, I'm out of here. <laughs> I had all this I can stand, and I got to get to doing something. So they finally said, "Yeah, you can go back." And by that time, we was uh, the Allied armies was clear up. Uh, well, let's see. I guess Bradley and uh, let's see. By that time, yeah, Bradley and Patton both had crossed the Rhine down there in the southern. Southern uh, Germany. <coughs> Both of them had crossed, partly anyway. Bradley had, uh, I forget, ten divisions or something like that across by that time. 
when that bridge fell down that he was crossing on. Oh, right, yeah. But anyway, uh, I, I got out and went back to, I was uh, holed up then at uh, Auxerre, France. It's a pretty little town, pretty nice town. In fact, I jumped in there earlier and, and kept them from blowing up the bridge. I, all I did was bazooka the the uh, explosives they had gathered when this truck <laughs> when this truck came in. All the crowds went across this bridge. See, I'm over there in the willows, and uh, only got five guys, and we're we're sitting there watching them, and and we got these two bazookas when. Uh, and you know our regular primer cord D2 and a few grenades and automatic carbines and stuff and, and uh, so we're sitting there watching and and the crowds all boy they come down there on the run with them vehicles and everything went across that bridge it's a real nice beautiful stone bridge Yon on the Yonne River Y O N N E and uh, <coughs> Anyway, they all run across the bridge just shortly after they got a crossway. Here comes two vehicles, them uh, kind of uh, like the, almost like our four by four, and uh, and they backed in there and they're clear full of explosives, <laughs> and uh, these crowds get out to to blow that beautiful little stone bridge. I mean, it was a pretty good sized bridge, yeah. but it it was so beautiful, it's all stone and everything. And, I said, hey, boy, I was going to save that bridge no matter what because it was, like I say, a beautiful bridge. And, and uh, it's almost like the one at Heidelberg, Heidelberg, Germany. But uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> I said, well, hey, boy, this has been a picnic. And I says, we just well start heating things up a little. So we was in a bunch of willows there alongside the river and and they, boy, they was in a hurry to get their stuff out, and get organized there, and they was getting out equipment. <coughs> we got down there just across from them, and we got our bazookas out there. And we shot into the back of those trucks, both of them, and oh my gosh, it just blew everything. They had enough explosives there to blow a big bridge, <laughs> blow them guys up and everything. But, uh, Anyway, that's where I uh, ended up there at Auxerre. I ended up uh, holed up there most of the time in between jumps. And yeah, between jumps, would you? <coughs> I, I take it you'd be kind of on call. Yeah. I went, uh, what would you do between that time? Just train and, and prepare? Yeah, and yeah I'd, I'd get other guys in a lot of the time, uh, 82nd guys. Some of them uh, just almost begged to come. Really? Yeah. yeah. And uh, and so whenever we would, I told Gavin, uh, General Gavin, he was over the 82nd, and I told Gavin, because whenever I'd go to Chafe to, uh, to a staff meeting, uh, general staff, if I'd go for, like, for breakfast and go up to Chafe, why, General Gavin would always have breakfast with me. And usually Patton would come in with all of his big importantness <laughs> and he'd look around and he'd have breakfast across from me so he could talk to me. Is that right? <laughs> wow. <Yeah>. Wow. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, that's what I'd do I'd, when I was uh, back there at uh, Auxerre. Why we had a, a manufacturing compound that had a whole lot of uh, cement floor. The buildings was gone. And uh, there's just these big monster cement slabs there, and a little bit of iron sticking out once in a while. But anyway, that's where I'd train other guys from the, especially from the 82nd. And so I told Gavin, I says, whenever <coughs> you get uh, somebody that's got common sense and, and uh, is really gung ho to go and do the job, I says, why, why send him on down to where I'm at? And, and we'll go through a few things together. And so I had quite a crew of guys then that I could draw from that uh, finally right there, literally at the end of the war, that I could draw from to uh, that were pretty well trained that could 
knew they knew where they was at. They knew all kinds of explosives and everything. And knew how to handle it. the biggest thing that we never did during World War II. We never taught any of our troops how to use the German guns. Well, when you're behind the lines, you have more German guns than you do your own, yeah. you know. And so the thing to do is to use them all that you can. And so whenever I jump in, <coughs> as soon as I'd get access to some German guns, well, I'd use them instead of mine, and save mine, you know. And uh, so that was one thing that uh, the American Army never ever did do. They never ever trained anybody how to use uh, German guns, and and some of them were, you know, you had to kind of halfway have some idea about what was going on in ordnance to to uh, figure out how they worked and everything, what size bullets they took and all that. And mm -hmm. So anyway, that. Uh, that's what I'd do there at Oxair, and then Eisenhower would call me there. Well, I only got back from from Liège, from the hospital, just, oh yeah, I told, I, I called Kapuf, my buddy. Uh -huh. I called him from Liège, and I says, Kapuf, I says, you get up here as fast as you can with a jeep and, and my gut. <laughs> he says, I thought you was dead. <laughs> he said, "He said I've been kind of trying to take over and stuff. I thought you was all dead." I said, "No, I come back to life. <laughs> you get up here and get, and bring my gun and and take me back." And uh, so that's what he did. So I had everything down here in Augustana then, and, and got my gun back. And, and uh, so then it was just a few days. Well, it might have been. It might have been two weeks, but you know, I was still all, I was running juice. I had a hole clear through this arm that was running juice, and, and those plates in my head was still running juice. And, and I was pretty bad shape, and I didn't have no teeth, and my tongue was only half healed, and, and my throat, I couldn't swallow nothing, and they had a trach in me. And uh, so, anyway, uh, I needed that two weeks bad, and uh, I got back there and was, you know, catching a bunch of vitamin D, and and uh, danged if I didn't get a radio call from Eisenhower. Gene, he says, you got to go. I said, Ike, I can't go. I says, I'm still too weak and too shot up. This is the only time that I had conflict, not really conflict, but, you know, I can't conflict with Eisenhower. Yeah. There's no way I <laughs> right, can conflict yeah. with him. Right. And uh, I says, Ike, I can't go. I says, uh, I just got about that far and I didn't get to finish the sentence. And he says, Gene, you're the only one that can go. So he says, get get what you need together and get over there to Dachau prison camp. Oh, wow. And because uh, we would He'd got the rumor that that uh, all those SS was going to come out of of uh, Munich, which Dachau is only twelve right. miles, right. twelve miles from Munich, and uh, and is going to come over there. And there were still about sixty five thousand prisoners there at Dachau, and he said the SS is uh, going to kill all of them. And he says we just really don't need that. He says for a political person purposes as much as anything else, we don't need that. And he says, get over there and, and kill all those SS. That's that's my job. That's when he when he says something, that's the everlasting law built in, written in stone, you know. You still in conference? And uh, uh, so anyway, uh, I, I told uh, the guys then, I. After I had it with Eisenhower, and we had that little talk, I, uh, I says uh, we got to go to Dachau and, and uh, go down to the prisoner of war camp, and and uh, I says uh, I'll need uh, 20 guys for that. And, uh, so I had, like I say, some pretty good troops there by that time. Mm -hmm. This is this is uh, literally at the end of uh, of April. Yeah, they had to, it, this is actually the 28th of April, yeah, of 45. And see, then uh, the E-Day was uh, May the 7th. 7th, yeah. 
And so we're basically right at the end of the war. And the Krauts know it too, you know. But the, that's exactly why the SS was coming down out of Munich to kill the rest of the prisoners there. And uh, all they had was a bunch of uh, automatic weapons. But, but there at uh, the prisoner of war camp, they had four machine guns. So that's what they're fixing to use on the rest of the prisoners. And by this time, the prisoners are in terrible, terrible shape. They're all a bunch of zombies. Uh, the Krauts uh, got those prisoners of war, or the uh, political prisoners as much as anything. Uh, Polacks and Jews mm -hmm. and, and uh, some of their own people and mm -hmm. uh, everything. They killed almost a million of their own people right there at Dachau, you know. And uh, so just about 900,000 of their own people they killed there at Dachau. But anyway, <clears throat> uh, I was to, my orders was to go in there and get rid of the SS. That's all that Eisenhower told me I was supposed to do. There's no possible way I can jump in behind the lines and liberate any prisoner of war camp or, or anything else without taking them with me. And I, I didn't have enough men for that. That 65,000 people yeah. still left there, you know. And, and so uh, that's what, after we got everything organized, why, that's what we did. We jumped in there on the night of the 28th of April and, uh, and went in there on the 29th. Early on in the morning of the 29th, I had two recoilless rifles with me there. The recoilless rifles we got in there in uh, about the middle of March, and uh, and they were never ever used yet in combat until I actually took two of them in there at uh, Dachau and blowed the gates off of the compound with the recoilless rifle. And uh, on the on the uh, north north side and kind of the east side of Dachau prison camp is a big canal of water that uh, uh, it's I think it's an irrigation canal for agriculture but uh, anyway that was clear full so and it's it's a pretty formidable thing so we had to to make sure when we jumped we wanted to jump actually right on the canal because of the cover of all the trees and stuff along that canal okay and uh, so we jumped in there at night and, uh, and then didn't do anything, just kind of got ourselves organized by morning. By early morning we was ready. And so we was out there along that canal and and I was, it's kind of a hill there. That that area between Munich, well, Oberammergau and Unterammergau and all of that area is all kind of uh, pretty, pretty fast hills. And uh, and in the south part of Munich is the same way, but anyway, uh, <clears throat> I got out there and I said, "Now is the time to try that damn rifle. See if it's any good." <laughs> so you hadn't even practiced on it. You used it prior to, to jumping. Had you had a chance to even shoot the thing? No, no. Oh, <laughs> no, it hadn't even. Been, well, of course, uh, you know they had tested it and yeah, all of that. Yeah. It had been shot a lot and everything, but it never been shot in combat or anything. And, and so it was just the small ones, that's all we could jump with. We couldn't take the 57s, they were too long. <clears throat> but uh, we had those 37s. And, and uh, so anyway, we, I told both the guys that, was, that jumped in with them, I says, put them right on the gates down there. I says, we're through with them gates. That was the biggest mistake I made on that jump because I figured, oh, then as soon as the gates was out, why all those prisoners of war had come out. But see, they didn't have no mind left. Mm -hmm. The Germans had put uh, hydrofluoric acid in the in the water, in their drinking water, and and so there's just all a bunch of zombies. And, but I didn't realize that, you know. <laughs> but anyway, that's what we did. We blowed the gates off. And, and How were you feeling at that point? I mean, had, because yeah, you weren't fully recovered yet. I mean, how did no, were you just no, running on adrenaline, or how did how were you managing physically? Yeah, I was just uh, barely getting along, and never 
chance I got why I just sat down and rested, you know, because boy, I was so weak and everything. And, but then, thank goodness, I was to the point where I was gaining strength back, and and uh, oh, I I couldn't hardly talk because, like I say, my tongue was basically cut off, and and I didn't have any teeth. That shrapnel went in there and it cut all of the teeth off. But then it left the roots in there and cauterized under the root, or above the root. So anyway, I was a mess. But I I could still run that 300 Magnum, and that was what the, what Eisenhower wanted me in there for. Because, you know, they made that gun for me at the arsenal, mm -hmm. and I, I used it all the way through the war. And, and so he wanted uh, he wanted me in there to be a running that gun. Like I say, I could still I could kill Krauts out there at 800 yards, and and they didn't have anything except artillery that would shoot that far. And the SS all they carried was uh, uh, automatic weapons, you know, and they didn't even carry the 7.9s. So they're helpless at uh, distance, you know, and uh, so. I just sit there and shot them all when they come down from Unicorn. I had guys planted all around there uh, telling me when. Basically, they came in there in like two and three and four guys at a time. And they'd, they'd walk in, some of them walk around the side and everything. But anyway, I shot 57 of them there. And uh, that was all that we ever had coming in. <laughs> wow. But anyway, there, then that was funny. There, uh, I had this photographer and this pencil pusher, this uh, lieutenant colonel, and uh, and that photographer took a picture that I didn't know anything about. It's like some of these I got the other day. I got a whole lot of pictures that was taken on Veterans Day down at the Budweiser Event Center. They had the spotlight on me for the Eagles uh, game down there. Oh right, yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, on Veterans Day, and they had uh, Marines with crossed uh, bayonets that I walked out under, and <clears throat> and then a bunch of uh, National Guard, and they're all saluting me as I come out from that arch of of bayonets, and and we got a whole lot of pictures of that here. Well, when they brought that picture there down here. Just uh, last week, why uh, they brought all those pictures from the Budweiser Center. But anyway, I had a photographer there, and I didn't know what he was doing. I didn't care. But anyway, he took a picture of me, back of me, when I was shooting three of those SS troopers. And uh, so if you go over there to dock out today, why, here's a great big cutout out of uh, heavy uh, plywood that's larger than life size of me shooting those krauts with that 300 magnum and and above me great big letters about that big all across the top it says liberation of doc owl wow <laughs> i couldn't uh, liberate nothing yeah. i couldn't liberate one man <laughs> <laughs> and so we've had a big funny about that with the rainbow division then came in the 49th they came in and actually liberated the camp and took care of the prisoners and everything. So, so did you stay and wait for us, uh, for the line to, to come up to, or did you go back to the line? You just waited for us to. Yeah, to, uh, yeah, I was there three days. Wow. See, when I jumped in there, the Allies was thirty miles. Well, during the hard part of the war, why thirty miles might take you two weeks, you know. But uh, then all we was doing was. Uh, just chasing them. Yeah, yeah. We had the tanks literally at full bore by that time, just before the end of the war. Why the Krauts was just running, you know, mm -hmm. and we was just chasing them. That's all we was doing. And, and so, actually, the the Rainbow come in there uh, uh, after after the wing infantry divisions was further along even than they were, and they came in to liberate the camp. And, and put personnel there and everybody's name and all of that. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, when they came in, why, and then I'm out of there. And we just loaded up in trucks and went back, and I went back to Augsar. <coughs>
that was was that your eleventh and final mission then, or did you have yes, it? That yeah. Was the, yeah. Well, uh, that was the final mission, but then I had to be at the surrender ceremony when uh, they came in. Uh, when uh, the Germans came in uh, there on uh, May the seventh, why? Eisenhower says, well, Gene, he says, uh, it's all over and everything. Everything will be all right. But he says, uh, if if it's all right with you, uh, he says, uh, you and Kapuf come in there ready for anything. Ready really? for anything. And he said that twice, ready for anything. And, uh, and so, mercy, we had big rolls of primer card, a bunch of grenades. And, our automatic carbines. What was he afraid was going to happen? Did he well, think? Well, he, uh, he didn't know whether the, the Germans had, uh, would uh, sacrifice themselves. Oh, okay, gotcha. See, there was three cars of them. Kind of like a suicide bomber type. Uh, exactly, okay. yeah. And, uh, and here's all these prime American troops. They're all spit and polish, you know. And they picked out all the ones that was over six foot to be out in front. And boy, they shined and polished everything they had. And here's all these prime troops right, right where the cars are going by, you know. And okay. Eisenhower didn't want a bunch of them Germans raising up with automatic weapons and stuff. And so, uh, <clears throat> so anyway, he says, "You and Kapuf fall in behind those tall guys with everything you can carry, and be ready for anything." And uh, said that twice, and, and so boy, we was <laughs> here. We are back there, looked like a couple of cowboys, you know, in with all that spit and polish. <laughs> and uh, so then, as soon as the ceremony was over and the Krauts had pulled out of there, they got their vehicles turned around and pulled out, and, and uh, Eisenhower come down there. He was on a kind of a podium up there by the brick schoolhouse there at Chafe and uh, where his headquarters was that's where the, the ceremony was at Reims, Reims, France and uh, so he come out and come down the same level that we was and and uh, right in front of everybody there and he called out he called I and Kapuf out there and, and that's when he gave me my eagles, my colonel's eagles, and, and quietly told me that he expected, he says, I'm giving you these because I expect you to go down to the South Pacific and set, oh, boy. set up the same kind of operation as you've done here in Europe. And I didn't tell him, but I felt like saying, oh, I'll go over the hill first. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I, so he raised each one of us a rank. Uh, Kapuf got to be a lieutenant colonel, and he gave me the full colonel. Wow! <clears throat> so then, that was the end of the war. So you didn't you didn't get transferred to the South Pacific then? No, no. They gave me ninety days to come back to the United States and and uh, furlough and recuperate. Mercy, I was yeah. in such bad shape then. I was all shot up. Everything on me was shot up somewhere, you know. And so he gave me 90 days, and uh, and then he says, report back to Gavin. At, he says, uh, you got to have some kind of papers to ship out. See, I was going through the whole entire war with no papers at all. And, uh, and every time I wanted to do something, even to come home, well, I had to go to Gavin, to General Gavin of the 82nd Airborne, to get papers to do something. And he'd have his staff make them out. And so uh, he said, take your your uh, furlough, your 90-day furlough. And he says, then report back to uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina, to where the 82nds. He says, they'll be there at that time. And, and uh, he says, get your papers to go across over into South Pacific. And so... I, that that got to be by the time I got away from there and everything. Why it was the, the end of May, and uh, 
So I just got back from uh, from furlough and went to uh, to Fayetteville, North Carolina, to the 82nd. Reported into General Gavin, and and I just got back there. I don't know. It was who I might have been there two weeks, maybe two or three weeks when they dropped got the, the bombs. bombs. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, I says, oh boy, it's homebound now. <laughs> so, in your furlough, did you go back to Nebraska to your folks? Yeah. And uh, how how would uh, did your your folks ever talk about that? Particularly your mom. I mean, she probably kept getting all sorts of telegrams. Your son's been injured in the war. I mean, she must have been a wreck through that whole period of time. Did she ever talk about how how she dealt with that? Or no, she, no? she's a hard headed Swede. You know, you're, you're expected, to, when you're a Swede, you're expected to do the job to the end, no matter what it is. Whether it's a war or in a plant or whatever, why you're expected to do it. Well, that sounds like uh, what kind of got you through all your missions was that that philosophy that it, yeah. I've got to do it. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. you'd mentioned earlier that you would bring in new recruits and, and train them to build up their confidence. Yeah. Did, where did you get your confidence? Who gave you yeah, confidence? Or well, it was just a natural confidence you had. Yeah, how did you? Yeah. How did I, you build yourself up? I knew that I that I could uh, overcome anybody or anything, and I had the physical ability and the strength and the knowledge to to do it. I could break anybody's, like yeah. I say, separate their head yeah. from their backbone. I could do that to anybody on the run, and uh, and different things that you know you can do so fast. You can break their shoulder blades, you know, just literally yeah. on the run, and uh, and I I knew that I had the physical strength and the ability to do that, and uh, so um, you think that's what kept you going? How you how oh, you managed? Yeah. I mean, yeah, any, I, I think any common man to go through I what could, you did would 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 break down, but uh, you you think that's what uh, oh, yeah. kept you going? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. You had to, even when I was paralyzed there in that in that shell hole and uh, couldn't move all that time. I was totally paralyzed. I thought, I gotta get over and then when I felt my little finger move, I thought, Oh, I gotta get over this right away and get back into killing them Germans. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, uh, that was the consensus all the time was to go do it. Go do it. Wow. And uh, no matter what, why well, you was expected to go do it. I'll be darned. And uh, I think Basically, that was the idea of most of the soldiers. Well, especially in like the the, 90, the first division, ninetieth division, and the third division, and the fifth division, and of course the eighty second airborne was was uh, replaced five and a half times. They lost over a hundred thousand men. The eighty second airborne alone, over a hundred thousand men. Think wow. of that. Wow. And, uh, you know, my gosh, uh, they talk now, you know, well, like in Vietnam, uh, maybe getting rid of 12,000 men or something there, you know, and mercy, we'd, we'd get rid of that many in half an hour in Europe, you know, and during World War II, and, and there it took 12 years for them to do it down there in Vietnam. And mm. So it, it wasn't any, uh, just a little play deal play operation like they've had ever since you know and yeah sure I feel for the guys out there they they've done just as much as we did but there are so few of them that did it you know for during World War two every single person was totally a hundred percent committed there wasn't any question no yeah. none zero absolute none no question you had to go do it and uh, any way you could do it, if you had to crawl there, or if you had to just do anything you could, you had to go do it. Wow. After, after all that you'd gone through and and were discharged and went back in civilian life, how was that transition for you to back in civilian well, life? Did you it was, did you have uh, you know like they talk about now the post traumatic? Oh, uh, that's a bunch of junk. No, you didn't people experience that, any of that, any nightmares or uh, any problem with uh, people. The, Aren't uh, aren't completely mature that go through that. They just aren't. And uh, so that's all a bunch of crap. And uh, uh, 
another thing was that I had uh, conditions right after I got out that helped a lot. Uh, I, I started uh, going to school at the University of Nebraska and uh, back then we had the GI Bill of Rights had just been ratified the first of uh, of uh, Jan January 1st of 1946 and uh, so we had uh, the the uh, rights to do things that we never hoped for to do before that we couldn't have probably ever done because we're coming right off the depression here yeah. and we're talking about uh, uh, very top wages thirty dollars a month you know a dollar a day was for twenty hours of work it was just uh, that was a king's ransom if you could get it you know and uh, so uh, the possibility of actually going from that to the university, you know, was just a, it was unthinkable. And, uh, and then they gave us when, when, uh, oh, I can't remember the Republican whip, uh, wrote, wrote and, uh, got past the GI Bill of Rights. That was like the greatest thing that we could ever think of in our lives, is that uh, we was going to get a chance. Well, it wasn't, uh, don't you feel, it wasn't given to you. I mean, you obviously, particularly in your case, you earned, you very much earned that and deserved that, don't you feel? Well, that, no, that was for the, for the people, for my wife. My family. So you returned out of the service. You went to University of Nebraska, and yes. and you'd said you'd already had uh, a bunch of credits from uh, your ten months uh, prior to that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I had I had uh, two years when I went in there, because I went in the service just almost right after I got out of the high school, mm -hmm. just shortly after I got out of high school. So uh, the the uh, training that I got in cadets gave me a full two years of college to start with. Okay. Yeah, and they gave me all the credits there at the University of Nebraska, which incidentally was still the top university in the United States and almost has ever since been. <laughs> <laughs> I take it you're a Cornhuster fan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what did you get your degree in then? Uh, I got a degree in medical research. Really? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, and I did that. Uh, for a while, and uh, but the GI Bill of Rights gave you the schooling and your books, but it didn't give you any living expenses whatsoever, not zero like they do now. Well, they get two thousand dollars a month now, for God's sake. <coughs> but uh, originally, why well, it didn't? It uh, it just gave you the education, and so I had to have a a job. And uh, so I broached the subject to the people there at the laboratory at the university when I was taking, starting to take medical research. And uh, they said uh, that uh, they needed, uh, they asked me if I could uh, be a teacher for, uh, uh, what do you call it, I can't think of names now. Uh, Anyway, I uh, I opened up uh, people every morning and and uh, see what they died from. Oh, like a coroner type. Uh, of? No, it wasn't uh, a coroner. Uh, there was a lot of coroners that came in there to to uh, learn what to do, but uh, pathology. Or? Uh, no, uh, what they do to you after you're dead is uh, the oh, I can't think. Like an embalmer or no, or, no. no. Uh, forensic. What? Forensic? No, forensic. Uh, no, I didn't have any forensic training. Oh. No, I, I uh, just, uh, uh, anyway, I, I 
Oh, God, I can't think of anything. That's okay. Uh, anyway, I did that every single morning while I opened up a new body, and, and then I had all these doctors and head nurses and, and uh, potential coroners and all of that in the classroom, and, and uh, then uh, I'd have them try to figure out what killed the person, you know, or what they died from or whatever. and. Uh, and so I had a, it was a, one of these rooms that goes up like that, and, and I had a big tank down below that had bodies in it, and, uh, and then a marble top table, and I'd pull the bodies out on that table and... Autopsy. Yeah, autopsy, yeah. yeah. I taught the autopsy class there for two years. <laughs> but anyway, I'd open them up, I'd cut them across under the rib cage there, and then down to the groin. And, and then take a little saber saw and saw the if it, if they was old or, or middle aged people anyway, where I couldn't cut through with a good knife. <coughs> Why uh, sometimes I'd just use I had a pair of almost like tin snips, <laughs> and uh, otherwise I'd take a little saber saw and saw their chest and open it up, put two sticks in there, and uh, laugh and. Uh, and then I'd have them try to figure out from looking at the inside, all of those people, try to look inside and see what the people died from. Anyway, I taught that autopsy class until I left the university. And uh, the second year I was there, in uh, 1947, I got the highest medical research grant given in the world from Eli Lilly. And half of it was for uh, to try to find something that would clot the blood, and half of it was for penicillin, and to do the research on penicillin. And uh, so then, of course, on clotting the blood, I found out that vitamin K is what clots the blood, and and the cheapest, most ready source of it is soybean oil. So within probably three or four years after that why every hospital in the world had vials of soybean oil in their emergency rooms and uh, and that's what they still yet to this day use to if you got a something you're bleeding to death leg cut off or something they hit you with that soybean oil and it just <laughs> instantly like that clots all the blood wherever they shoot it and, uh, and then they can fix all of that, get it fixed and washed up. And then they give you some decon to, to start your blood circulating again in your blood. But anyway, that was half of my research project was to find something. If we'd had something like that during World War II, we could probably save at least 100,000. Mm -hmm. You know how many casualties was was in World War Two, one million eight hundred and thirty two thousand. Almost two million men. Wow. American white young white American men. Right. There wasn't any any blacks that was against the law for the blacks right. to, Segregated. Yeah. to even carry a, a knife or a gun. And they could be court martialed for ever being caught with a knife or a gun. And uh, that was almost two million young white Americans. <clears throat> so then from the uh, University of Nebraska, where did you progress uh, well, a little bit with your got, career? And I, I got so deeply into that uh, penicillin thing. First place, I I was the one that, that found out that there's actually seven kinds of penicillin, and I divided them and, and uh, give different dosages and mixed dosages of penicillin to kill virus and uh, found out that it won't kill them. All it does is stop the growth. And uh, so after just an awful lot of not going home at night and, and keeping my eye on a microscope for maybe 36 hours at a time, see if you get one division, if you got a bunch of virus, and you give them a shot of whatever you're working with and all those little virus are sitting there and they just keep kind of moving back and forth and 
and all at once one of them starts to get like a figure eight and divides in the middle then that's a new growth and uh, and so you got a mutate of the original animal that has actually developed within the medication that you've given it and so it's completely immune from then on to your dosage and this this can all happen within just a, a like one minute or even a half of a minute 30 seconds well you can get a new life there a division and then your whole experiments down the tubes you've got to start over and uh, so that finally got the best of me and I got pneumonia and got down to 160 pounds and so I went to school told him that I was leaving I'd never work inside again as long as I live <laughs> so I came here and started building houses and <laughs> came to came to Fort Collins and was it was a contractor yeah, uh -huh. yeah. and uh, talk a little bit about your family uh, when did you uh, how and when did you meet your wife and how many children do you have and then then we'll then we'll start to wind down this interview yeah I had uh, well uh, when I got out of uh, jump school, uh, why, uh, I well, I and the wife had we had started going together for long before I went in the service. But uh, when I graduated from high school, I graduated when I was sixteen, and I had a uh, full four-year football scholarship to the University of Washington. And uh, so I thought, well, I should go out there. And uh, so I and my older brother, we jumped on a freight train and uh, bummed our way out to Washington State and went through the university. And they showed all the facilities to me and everything. And, and so I told them I'd uh, probably be back, but it'd be the second semester. <laughs> And I wouldn't be a play in that first semester or practicing or anything because I had things that need to be wound up at home. And uh, <clears throat> so then, of course, the uh, war started that fall and, or that winter, actually. And uh, so then I never, never got to use the scholarship or huh. anything. But... Uh, Anyway, uh, before I went out there, why I and the wife had started going together. So then, I was I was working construction when I wasn't old enough to go in the army. Like I say, I was yeah. superintendent of over four thousand men right. up there at Alliance, Nebraska, when I was seventeen years old, and I was I was the general superintendent, and uh, I had over four hundred trucks there and. And all kinds of drag lines and back holes and all kinds of stuff to work with. And uh, so then I moved around to some other construction jobs, and I was uh, going with the wife at that time, but I was gone about 90% of the time or more, 95% of the time. And, and so then I went into service, and of course I was gone then <laughs> and was gone all the time until finally. After I got out of jump school, as soon as I got out of jump school, I, she said, I said, well, I'm, I'm headed across over to England for, for what we call later D-Day, for the beginning yeah. of the invasion of Europe, you know. And, well, they'd invaded down there, but Italy, but that yeah. was just kind of a play deal, <coughs> diversion tactic. So anyway, that was the way that went. And, uh, so we got married then. And, uh, when you got out of jump school? Yes. Okay. And uh, and then uh, I had uh, my mother and father had been separated since I was uh, about four years old, and uh, so sometimes I'd be out to pause, and then I'd be in the malls and. And like I say, I left completely when I was 11 years old. The day I turned 11 years old was when Paul loaned me the 
team and wagon. Right. And, yeah. and I left there and started making my own living and started making their living too. By the time I was 12, I was making a living for, for Pa and Ma and my brothers. Wow. And, uh, and another fellow that had quite a little to do with raising me. I was paying all the taxes on his houses, so the, he had 23 houses, but he, he didn't have any income on them, from them. They couldn't even pay the taxes. All the taxes was either 6 or $7 on every one of them. Hmm. And they couldn't pay them. So I had to pay them in order to keep the county from taking those houses. And I did that by uh, shooting and breaking horses and there at the cavalry station. So anyway, uh, then when I, when I went in service, first thing I did was make a uh, allowance for for Ma. She got she got uh, oh, two thirds or three fourths of my pay. You set it up to whatever you want, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. the, the maximum amount you can do is like three fourths of your pay. And so I give her that. Sent it to her every month, and uh, and then I got her some other things uh, coming in that she needed. Uh, electric iron. She did quite a lot of of uh, washing and cleaning, ironing and everything too. And, and I got things for like that. And uh, and so every single month I'd get a nickel until I started getting flight pay. And you can't allot your flight pay. So I got all of my flight pay. And then after I got flight pay, why well, then I went into paratroopers. And they double your your basic right. money, and so you can't allot that. You can't allot your jump pay, and so I was getting uh, jump pay and flight pay that couldn't be allotted, and still giving my wife and my mother a full allowance. <laughs> wow. So yeah, anyway, I had a lot of fun. Uh. <clears throat> No regrets. Yeah. How many years were you and your wife uh, married? I know she passed away in number of years back. Sixty years. Sixty years. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just, wow. Just like uh, November thirtieth until January the twenty fifth. In sixty years. Hmm. <laughs> and how many children do you have, Jean? I've got two living. Yeah. I lost two boys and a little daughter. Mm. <clears throat> mm. So well, I guess that's about my story. <laughs> wow, that's an incredible story. <laughs> well, there's a lot of, you know, we could go into like book after book after book, the details yeah, of some yeah. of these jumps that yeah. I made, you know, and uh, everything. But you know, that's just. Uh, I think what you told us was, is a good flavor of what the yeah. missions were like. Incredible, incredible story. Yeah, that, that's the main. Well, one, you get the gist of the whole thing. Right, that right. Way. Well, one question I always like to ask when I do these interviews, and I'm kind of almost ashamed to ask give, uh, this question, but uh, uh, how do you think that war experience affected your life, changed your life, played a role in your life? What? Or, well, it, actually, all it did was. Uh, Take a little time out. That's the way you see it, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, that's all it did actually is just take a little time out of my life, and uh, and it was you know that kind of prime time when you go from. Actually, I took my cadet exam when I was seventeen, and then I got out when I was twenty-one. <clears throat> wow. Wow. Well, I want to. Uh, Thank you very much for sitting here to tell us your incredible story, but more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Thank you. Gene, can I have uh, have you describe some of these medals on, in your uh, in your case here? Yeah. The, uh, Do you need let's see. Oh yeah, this is uh, Distinguished Service Cross. Uh huh. 
there's just a few of them ever given. And see, this has got two oak leaf clusters on it, so I got three purple hearts and uh, silver star and uh, bronze star. And uh, you guys are okay, aren't you? Good conduct medal and uh, European medal and uh, victory medal and uh, this and uh, <coughs> the Belgian uh, Legion of Merit. This is the Legion of Merit. And, uh, and then, uh, I don't know, I can't remember. That's a common one, but I can't remember. And then, uh, paratrooper wings and uh, cadet wings. I guess I don't have any pilot wings. I took them. Oh, and then here's a, a rifle. Expert rifleman badge. Right, yeah. I guess that's about all.